Devil of a Chance, Devil's Own Book 1, by Kiara Graves. Chapter 1 Some Azrael. Darkness filled the house. The only noise came from the light pattering of rain against the windows. A storm was moving up from the south, a bad one judging from the gusting winds. I stood in the living room of the sprawling one-story house, my head on a swivel, as it was every minute I guarded Lucifer's lover and their newborn daughter. My sword, forged in the fires of hell and imbued with the power of my domain, was sheathed at my back. I had five knives strapped across my chest over my black shirt. Outside, thunder rumbled, and the wind howled around the corners of the house while the rain turned into a torrential downpour. I told myself to move, the same as I did every time this night played out. I knew what came next. I'd known every day for the last however many years of my torment, trapped in this literal hell. I knew. And yet, all I could do was let it play out all over again. Tugging my sleeves up my forearms, I turned, waiting for the impact that would break open the front door. Two lightning strikes, then the attack would come. The first burst of light flooded the room, nearly blinding me, a sharp crack echoing through the house. The second lightning strike hit, and I told myself to turn and brace for the assault. Yet, I didn't move an inch. A loud thud sounded behind me. I whirled around. The front door had been thrown open. A figure entered, my height with a gun in his right hand and a sword in his left. Two more men stepped into view from behind him. They stank of the sins committed over their lifetimes, or at least they had. Here, in hell, trapped in this illusion there was no smell. I didn't need it to be replicated, to remember the stench that wafted off their flesh. Get the baby, the first man ordered while I drew my sword, my face morphing with my rage. Demon hunters, sent by the order of the unholy dragon, had come for Lucifer's child. Hunters or not, they were still humans. Easy enough to kill. And yet somehow, they overpowered me. How? How had they bested me this night? They charged into the house and opened fire. I ducked, attempting to avoid the shots. The few bullets that did hit me weren't enough to take me down. This might be a reliving of a memory, but the pain was real. Each round that burrowed deep into my flesh burned, not with fire, but with guilt and the knowledge of my failure, my greatest sin. The men rushed for the hall and the bedrooms. I charged, tackling them to the floor. The first one I bashed in the face, knocking him out. The second one, I tore his gun free of his grip, and we scrambled back to our feet. Our blades clashed to the sounds of the storm raging outside. A vicious slash sliced open my back. I snarled, kicking aside the man in front of me to face the one behind me. A yell came from the back bedroom, followed by a baby's shrill cry. The man I thought was knocked out had snuck past me to the hall. Cursing, I ran to follow. Two sets of hands held me back. They shouldn't have been this strong. Each breath weakened me, and I sank to my knees, my vision blurring. Something heavy slammed into the back of my head. I toppled to the carpet, the baby shrieks fading away. When I came to, every inch of me ached. I pushed up off the floor with shaking arms. My stomach heaved from the hit to my head. My clothes were crusted in blood from the bullet wounds and the slash on my back. I made it to my feet, leaning against the wall for support. Look at what you did, a harsh voice whispered through my mind. No, I uttered, because that's what I'd said that night. Blood trailed down the hall, past me to the front door. It couldn't be real. Stumbling down the hall, I made it to the back bedroom, falling to my knees with the reality of my failure laid out bare. The room was a mess. Broken furniture tossed everywhere, blood covered the sheets, the walls, some even on the ceiling. And the crib, the black crib where she'd slept, was empty and torn to pieces. You did this, the voice went on, while tears of disbelief and grief wended their way down my face. You killed them. Failure. That's what you are. A failure, one who never deserves to see the surface again. The bedroom shimmered in and out of view while the voice went on and on, until I howled, beating my fists on the floor. A stab to my back drew a yell out of me, and I lashed out, fighting the demon who did it. A demon who bore a striking resemblance to me. His eyes were solid black, 
and in his hand was a dagger dripping with my blood. Two more figures stepped out from behind him, crowding the bedroom, all wearing my face. Their blood is on your hands, the first demon grated. I shook my head, even with the truth right there in front of me. You're wrong. Am I? He nodded to my hands. Slowly I raised them, staggering back to see them coated in blood. You swore an oath to protect them with your life. Lucifer trusted you to keep them safe, and yet you're the one standing here, not them. You're a failure. A disappointment. You'll never be worthy of his good graces again. I threw myself at the demon, meaning to strangle him. Instead, he buried the dagger into my abdomen. I gasped, staggering back, and the other two versions of me moved in. Their whispered words turned into a chant that penetrated deep into my very soul, lashing it, tearing it to shreds. I was thrown from one demon to the other, beaten and battered, as I deserved to be for what I'd done. This was my punishment, created from the stain of my sins. That's what every cell in hell was created and powered by. Sins. Mine had been against Lucifer himself. The three twisted versions of me attacked me until I was on the floor, unable to move. One by one they trailed away, leaving me in a bleeding heap. The image of the bedroom slipped away until I was left staring at the cold gray stone walls of my circular cell. There were no comforts here. Why would there be? The air was thick with the oppressive atmosphere of the rest of the sinners trapped in the ninth level of hell. Their screams were nothing but background noise after all this time. I used to be on the outside of the bars, keeping an eye on the souls of the damned. Then Lucifer had taken me on as a personal bodyguard. His first duty for me was to protect his daughter, the only child he ever had. I wasn't sure how long I'd been here. Time passed so differently in these cells. Not that it mattered. Time was irrelevant now. My eyes shut and I passed out. I thrashed and snarled on the ground, jarred awake by a stab to the back. Three demons stood in the cavernous room of my cell. The voices inside my head hissed in a continuous rant, even while I stood up to face the demons who joined me. I had no weapons, since this was not a vision. It was reality. My clothes were stiff when I moved, covered in decades of bloodshed and ripped to tatters. The voices in my head shifted in tone until it was Lucifer himself shouting at me for what I'd done to him. Hearing his rage, his disappointment, his disgust was hard enough. Feeling how deeply I'd cut him, how his entire body ached as if his heart was ripped from his chest and his inside shredded, was far worse than any sensation I'd experienced in my 300 years of living. It drove me to slam my hands to my ears, falling to my knees. Nothing I did ever drowned out the voices or chased away the weakness and guilt spreading through my limbs, but I couldn't take it any longer. The demons gave me no chance to brace for their assault. I reacted on instinct, not that it saved me. This was my personal hell, and there was no avoiding the pain no matter how hard I fought back. The madness running rampant in my mind came with flashes of that night. How I'd let three humans overpower me. I was pathetic, wretched, a stain on this world. I was nothing. A blade cut deep into my forearm, and I grimaced, jerking away from the pain. Blood spilled from the wound, one of many injuries I endured. A fist collided with my face, making my eyes water. Another struck my stomach, knocking me to my knees. Gasping for air, I wrapped an arm around my middle, spitting blood. The three demons surrounded me. None of them made a move forward, hesitating. I growled and they charged. There was no room for mercy, not here, not after what I'd done. Weakened by the numerous slashes and stabs covering my back, chest and legs, I failed to block most of their hits and ended up taking a dagger to the back. Again. Another stabbed into my ribs. I waited for the third, needing to feel that biting agony when a furious bellow to stand down cut through my panting breaths. I hadn't even heard my cell door open, let alone the heavy footfalls of another demon. His presence pushed in around me, his age and power evident in his aura filling the room. Leave us, the voice ordered, the steel edge to his words sending the demons marching away. I remained on the ground, 
gritting my teeth against the agony assaulting my body. Digging my claws into the stone, I waited for him to leave too. Instead, but he crouched before me. So Mazrael, Hephaestus, the blacksmith of hell and the half-brother of Lucifer, scowled. Hef was as tall as me, nearly six and a half feet, with horns that stretched back with a slight curve at the end. His dark blue eyes bordered on black from his simmering anger. He wore a long red leather jacket over a black silk shirt, black pants and boots. His visible dark skin was covered in various tribal and demonic markings he'd collected over the centuries. Why are you here? I whispered, my voice hoarse and coming out garbled. Maybe he wasn't even here. In all the years I'd been trapped in this room, my punishment hadn't altered. That could always change. That's how these cells work for the damned. Why do you think, he bit off. How much longer are you going to do this to yourself? Wincing, I pushed off the floor until I was kneeling, wrenched the dagger from my ribs and tossed it aside. The wound sealed too soon for my liking. Eternity, I spat. No less than I deserve. Eyes narrowing, he walked around me and pulled the dagger from my back, muttering under his breath while he hurled it away. Enough of this, you hear me. Enough of punishing yourself. It's been years. Lucifer released you from this torment a decade ago. I tensed. Had it really already been ten years since I was told I was free to go? How long had I been here until that point? No matter. This was my new home. I accepted that the moment Lucifer tossed me in. And that absolves me of my sin. I snapped, feeling the rest of my wounds mending. Lucifer's shouts rattled through my mind, and my eye twitched, fighting the urge to grasp my head and curl into a ball on the floor until it stopped. It was nearly 25 years ago. You have to forgive yourself at some point. That's it. That was how long I'd been here. Why had Lucifer released me ten years ago? Why was Hef here now? How can I? I bellowed abruptly, my claws lengthening while my fangs protruded harshly from my gums. I failed him. I failed her. I should be down here, forever. Doing what? Reliving that night, having yourself beaten to within an inch of your life, bled nearly to death just to do it all over again. There are far worse souls that deserve such torment. You wouldn't understand. You're right. I wouldn't. Hef grabbed my shoulders, digging his sharp claws in when I tried to pull away. No one can, but I'm not going to let you stay down here being brutalized and reliving the worst moment of your life. Not anymore. I growled, shoving his hands away. Getting to my feet took effort, and I grunted with each shift of my beaten and battered body. I stormed to the arched stone doorway that led out of the room I'd resigned myself to these last years. Lucifer had me thrown in the ninth level of hell as punishment for my failure. I'd once been a renowned guard for the king of hell. As a reward, he entrusted me to keep the one thing most precious to him safe. But I hadn't. Lucifer locked me in this very room, telling me death would be too easy for me, and I hadn't seen him since. There's nothing for me outside this cell, I whispered. You can work your way back through the ranks, Hef said, meeting me at the door. You might be nearly 300, but you're young. You have time to reclaim your honor. To what end? I'm not leaving this room without you. You're coming with me even if I have to knock you out and drag you from this cell. I glanced out the door, still hearing Lucifer's angry shouts from that night. I was there the moment he realized what had been taken from him. As part of my punishment, I was forced to relive the horror of realizing what had occurred. There was nothing inside me now. Nothing but a damaged soul consumed by darkness and hatred that would never fade. Hatred for whoever destroyed my life by taking her away from me. Cries and screams from the other damned ones occupying this level of hell flowed down the twisted stone corridor and into my cell. The souls trapped here for eternity created their own torture as I had done the moment that door slammed shut behind me. Human souls were far more fragile than a demon's. They at least were dead already, but I wasn't. My pain was physical and mental. Lucifer should have killed me and been done with it. 
I'll never be in his good graces again, I whispered, the words hard to get out. The last time Lucifer had looked at me, there'd been nothing but disgust and resentment in his silver eyes. Maybe not, but don't you want a chance to prove yourself? Hef said quietly. How? I demanded, hating him for offering me this chance. Whispers of the taunting voices I'd heard on replay for years rushed through my mind. I rolled my head on my shoulders, growling quietly in an attempt to silence them. They only grew louder until I shouted, smashing my fist into the wall. The jarring pain shooting up my arm quieted the chaos for the time being. Hef's eyes narrowed with worry. I heard something today. A rumor. I want you to help me see if it's true. Take someone else. I don't want to take someone else. I'm taking you, and you'll see why if you come with me. He held my face in his hands and pressed our foreheads together. You were always more than just another demon to me. You've been my brother, and I cannot sit by another second while you torture yourself over someone who might not be dead. I frowned, jerking away at his words. What did you say? You know exactly what I said. He let me go and strode to the door, swung it open, and waited. The notion of freedom had been lost on me years ago. But what if Hef was right? It wasn't possible. It couldn't be. The slightest bit of hope that he was right fought against the darkness swirling inside my soul. Swallowing hard, I took a step then another, until I was at the door to my cell. Hef walked out first and nodded. The voices of my torment reared up, screaming at me to stay, that this was a trick and I was going to fail once again. I walked out that door and the voices dulled, becoming nothing more than white noise. The weight of guilt and despair that had pressed in around me from my cell lifted, and I took a deep breath in. When I let it out, the little strength I had left seemed to go with it. I faltered with that first step and have draped my arm around his shoulders. We started a slow walk down the corridor. Each black door we passed housed another damned soul, most howling and screaming for mercy. None of them would ever get a second chance. Not like I was. We'll get you cleaned up, fed properly, find clothes that aren't caked in blood, let you have a good night's sleep. Then we'll set out, Hef told me when we neared the main junction for the ninth level. At its center was a guarded platform etched in ancient symbols of hell. Once we were on it, We'd be transported to whichever level we chose, or out of the levels and into the heart of hell itself. We were nearly there when the four demons standing guard around it squared their shoulders, bowing as one. A wave of heat rolled over and through me, telling me precisely who approached from the other direction. Every demon could feel his presence. He was the oldest of us, after all, the very first to step foot in this domain. Emotions I hadn't sensed in decades mixed with my own, and I struggled to swallow back the growl trying to slip free. Slowly, I lifted my head, and a pair of silver eyes filled with fire glared back at me from across the platform. Lucifer. He wasn't merely our king. He was, in a sense, our creator. It was his hellfire that created demons. That same fire flowed through our veins and powered every inch of hell. His fury and disgust weren't only felt by me from the subtle cringing of the other demons. He was tall and lean in appearance, but I was no fool. Beneath his black silk shirt was a strength enough to tear a demon limb from limb if he so desired. His firm jaw was clenched while he stared me down. A bloody rag was in his right hand, though both hands were still covered in gore. Short black hair surrounded two elegantly curved obsidian horns that stretched back along his head. His nostrils flared, and when his lips parted, his fangs extended as if he debated throwing himself across the platform and finishing me off. The air crackled with fiery tension. I flinched when my skin burned, bracing for the end, knowing Hef's offer had been too good to last. Then Lucifer pulled back on his emotions as if slamming a mental wall down to keep us all out. That was his gift and his curse, having every demon feel as he did unless he blocked us out. He gave me one last repulsed glance that turned to one of warning, then his gaze shifted to Hef. He stepped onto the platform and disappeared in a column of fire. I sagged, not believing my luck. Hef chuckled until I glared at him. What? 
If he wanted you dead, you'd be dead, he said, maneuvering us onto the platform. You going to tell me what you're up to yet? No, but if I'm right, you may find yourself back in Lucifer's good graces far sooner than you think. Chapter 2 Ashmiel Rock music blared from the small bar speakers behind me while I wiped down the counter with a wet rag. Not like it ever did much good. The damn thing was always sticky. Hank, the guy who owned this hole in the wall known as Hank's Hideaway, said it was supposed to be sticky. It had been like that for decades before I came along. Two guys sat down at the bar. I dropped the rag and went to get their orders. Jerry, Vic, usual? I asked the two regulars. The burly men in leather biker vests nodded, and I set out two glasses filling them with whiskey. When are you going to get out of this place, huh? Jerry, the older and graying of the two, acts. You're too good for this shithole. I laughed, leaning on the counter. Don't let Hank hear you say that. Hank can kiss my ass. He should have fired you by now. Let you go do something more worthwhile than waiting on assholes like us. Oh now Jerry, don't talk about yourself like that, I teased with a wink. We all know Hank's the worst asshole of them all. Ouch, Hank the man in question said from behind me. I turned, smirking at the hand he had over his heart, and how he dramatically rolled his eyes. That hurts, girly. Really hurts. Might have been a killing blow. I shook my head while Hank sidled by me to get behind the bar. He was over six feet tall and had the start of a beer gut. The long black hair he had back when we first met was turning white at the temples with a few random gray streaks here and there. The crow's feet around his eyes had deepened too, and there were a few more lines around his forehead and mouth. He wore all black as usual, with two leather bracelets on his right wrist, each with a small metal plate. One read strength and the other love. Hank scared most people off with a peek, but he was a teddy bear when he wasn't making drunks piss their pants if they crossed the line. He'd been married once upon a time, until his wife was taken from him. Cancer was a bitch, he always said. It was the only time I'd seen that man shed a tear, talking about her. I topped Jerry's and Vic's glasses off, and turned around to check if we needed anything from the back. My black and silver streaked hair was coming loose from its bun. Quickly, I redid it, the black and silver strands slipping through my fingers while I studied my reflection. The silver was natural, something few people believed when I told them. I'd had it as long as I could remember. My mom's hair had been a silverish gray, but there'd been no black to it. My eyes weren't like hers either. She had the bluest irises, blue like the sky in summer. Mine were a shimmery silver, and unlike any other I'd ever seen. I always assumed I took after my dad, a man I never met and had no idea who he was. Mom only slipped up once about what kind of man he was. She said he was a bad guy, who put our lives in danger by merely existing. It was why we'd run away when I was a baby, and why we'd always been on the move. She'd looked so sad and lonely when she mentioned him. He might not have been some knight in shining armor, but she'd clearly loved him. With her dead these past twelve years, I had no one else to ask who he was. I'd made it this far in life without knowing him. I'd managed to survive the rest of my life the same way just fine. Yeah, but maybe he's the reason you don't really feel anything except fiery anger that comes out of nowhere. My lips thinned at the annoying sound of my inner voice. Who says I don't feel anything but that? I could be happy if I wanted to. And Hank, I care about him. That's feeling. And look how long it took for you to reach that point. It might also explain your other issue. I don't have another issue. Really? You know Hank was right. You should have seen a shrink all those years ago. It could have helped with all this damn denial of yours. I don't have any other issues, I muttered under my breath. Tell that to the long sleeve shirts you wear. Or why you ended up on your own in the first place. It's been twelve years. Let it go. I'm not the one who can't let it go. Just shut up, all right? I said louder than I meant to, but no one at the bar noticed, thankfully. If anyone ever heard me arguing with myself like this, they'd think I'd lost it. 
Sadly, my inner voice that had grown far louder since I'd been on my own was right. Even before mom died, I'd always felt disconnected from the world around me. I was here, but not here, merely going through the motions. Most of the time, it was like I was in a fog some days. Hank had asked me one time why I always put on such a fake smile for the world. I told him it made everyone shut up and leave me alone. A real smile was too hard when every day I was vividly aware of feeling as if someone cut a chunk of my soul away. He dropped the matter and poured me a shot of whiskey, then told me to lighten up. My anger was another beast altogether. After years of practice, I managed to shut it down with some deep breathing and distancing myself from whoever was pissing me off. A few times I failed, and Hank saw firsthand how much of an animal I turned into. The few people I'd hurt before Hank or Zane got me under control had been customers that were a little too handsy. The regulars all just said I was hot-headed, but I remembered Hank's reaction the first time he saw me lose it. His eyes had gone wide, and his hands had shaken while he'd guided me to the back room to cool off. He'd studied me with a severe scowl on his face. That had been the first time he asked me what really happened to me while I lived on the streets. I hadn't been able to tell him, and after a while, he dropped it. A few times he'd attempted to get me to see a therapist, and each time I flipped him off. I honestly had no idea why the old bastard put up with me all these years. Quit your daydreaming, girly, Hank's gruff voice sounded from behind me and I prepped my fake smile. His reflection appeared in the mirror beside mine, but there was a sour look on his face. What's wrong? I asked, spinning around. They're back. My hands curled into tight fists at my sides, following Hank's glare across the bar. I skipped over the regulars, a few college kids out for a night on the town, and the demon sitting at a corner table. The neon lights reflected off his obsidian horns, but the demon wasn't the issue. They came in here every now and again, as did the fallen angels that hung around our city in the middle of the Nevada desert. None of them caused issues, not for us personally. What they did with the humans outside these doors was their business, and we stayed out of it. No, what had Hank cursing were the three guys two tables over from the demon. The first night they came in, I knew they were going to be trouble. They kept their heavy leather jackets on, even though it was summer and the bar's AC was set relatively warm. Hank was getting up there in age and hated being cold. The men would order tequila shots with their beers, and stay at their table the entire time. Some nights, a fourth guy would show up. He'd stay a few minutes, leave, and the three others would pay and follow not too long after. For the past two weeks, they'd been showing up. Two nights ago, they'd started a fight when a drunk guy got a little too close to them. Hank had broken it up, but during the scuffle, I'd spotted the knife sheathed at the redhead's hip. That would have been enough to set me off, worried he'd use that blade on Hank. The murderous glint in the redhead's green eyes was what had made me round the bar, ready to give him the same treatment he gave Hank, until Zane, our bouncer, intervened. He dragged me away, but not before the redhead had spotted me, licked his lips, and shifted his hips suggestively. Zane had to physically pick me up at that point, to get me away from the asshole. What do you think they're doing? I whispered, looking anywhere but at the three men. I had to stay in control. No going off on the customers, not unless they started it. Nothing good, Hank replied. You remember what I told you? I huffed, rolling my eyes. Yeah, no one serves their table but you. I tugged on the sleeves of my long sleeve gray shirt with a black skull on the front. You sure you just don't want to call the cops? Or I could always find a way to scare them off. Could serve them the beer that went bad. The mischievous glint in Hank's eyes said he was considering the last option. Let's see how the night goes. Deal. I wanted to argue, but Hank was hard-headed. I let it go and went back to tending the bar I'd worked behind since I was 21. Before then I worked in the back, stocking shelves and even cooking a bit. After hours I'd helped clean the place, and Hank had taught me how to mix drinks. Not that anyone knew except him, and the four other employees that I'd been around for that long. They all thought he hired me almost four years ago. Hank found me when I was 15, digging through the dumpster behind his bar. I remembered that night clearly. 
We'd stared at each other for what seemed like forever, until he opened the back door and asked if I was hungry. He was the only person I trusted in this world. Everyone else I met either abandoned me or tried to screw me over. Not Hank. I owed that man everything. It was thanks to him, I was finally able to stop looking over my shoulder. An echo of the night my life fell apart threatened to distract me, but I breathed in deep, let it out, and did what I always did, shoved that memory down as deep as I could. The evening wore on, and I mixed drinks while I chatted with the customers, keeping my pretty fake smile plastered on my face the entire time. It was turning out to be a typical Friday night. Around half past ten, I ducked into the back room to grab more ice. A shout from the bar had me rushing back through the door. Hank was at the table with the three guys. He pointed to the door, his face bright red, but none of the guys rose to their feet. I glanced around for Zane, but he was busy at the front dealing with a set of drunks arguing with him over taking their keys. Taking the bucket of ice with me, I marched over to stand a little behind Hank. The intense flash of heat that hit me left sweat beating on my brow, and my hand tightened around the thin handle of the ice bucket. I want you gone, you hear me? Hank snapped. All of you out. Now. Calm down, old man, the redhead muttered with a wink and sly grin which sent an uncomfortable shiver down my back. We'll leave when we're good and ready. You don't want to be kicking out good-paying folk now, do you? I don't want your money, Hank stated and pointed to the door again. Out of my bar and don't come back. When no one moved, Hank grabbed the closest one by the arm and dragged him off the tall bar stool. Time seemed to speed up. The man balled his hand into a fist and connected with Hank's face. Hank fell back, staggering to keep his balance, blood dotting his lip. The fiery flash turned into a spike of heat, shooting through me. I shouted and chucked the ice at the guy. He cursed, swatting it away. I shoved him hard enough to send him reeling into a table filled with people. He crashed into it with enough force to knock them all to the floor. The redhead rushed around the table for me, and I grabbed the chair closest to me while the rest of the bar broke out into chaos. Zane yelled, his voice rising over the fighting, but I'd lost sight of him and Hank. The redhead stomped toward me. I grunted, swinging the chair into him. He was thrown into another group of bystanders and quickly disappeared beneath their legs. The last guy at the table launched himself over it and right for me. He took me to the floor, his fist aimed at my face. I dodged it, smirking when he punched the hard floor instead. Grabbing him by his shoulders, I hefted him off me, and he vanished into the melee. A hand appeared in my face, and I took it. Jerry and Vic were both giving me wide-eyed gazes, which I ignored. This wasn't the first time they'd seen me lose it. Still don't think you're weird? Shut up, I snapped at my inner voice. Just saying you're getting stronger if you hadn't. You all right, girly? Hank's voice came from behind me, cutting through the voice inside my head. Yeah, great. You. He wiped at his bleeding lip and shook his head. Peachy, he muttered. We're closing down, folks. Everyone out. Drinks on the house tonight. There was a smattering of cheers and the bar quickly emptied, with Zane guiding people out the door. I kept looking for those three guys, but they must have already snuck out. Pity. They all could have done with at least one more punch to the face. Zane was on his phone, probably with the taxi company, ensuring everyone had a ride to get their asses home safe. Jerry and Vic hung back, still giving me weird looks until I finally snapped. What? I wasn't going to let them beat up Hank. Jerry's head bobbed slowly. You are, you're a lot stronger than you look. I shrugged, starting to write bar chairs that had been flipped over. Adrenaline. Yeah, we'll go with that, Vic muttered. Jerry and Vic murmured to Hank, patted him on the back and headed out the door. Zane locked it behind them. When he spun around, he too had a curious expression in his eyes. Avoiding him, I went about picking up the mess. I kept waiting for Hank to go off on me for inciting a brawl in his bar, but he didn't say a word. While I cleaned up, the fight replayed in my head. I'd been in a few skirmishes in my time on the streets. Each time, the same heated flash would hit me right before that fire would take over my body. 
I didn't want to admit it, but I was getting stronger. Those men had easily been twice my size and those bar stools weren't light. My hands stilled in picking up beer bottles. All I wanted to do was blend in, pretend I wasn't some weird freak of nature, and get on with my life. The last thing I needed was a fallen angel realizing I had some supernatural ability and trying to recruit me. Or deciding I was a threat and killing me. Shit, the demon. There had been a demon here. Had he seen the whole fight? They didn't try to recruit humans like me. They straight up stole their souls. Go home, girly, Hank called, and I jumped. Ashmiel? Good, I'm good. I should stay and help clean up. You're good. I got this. Go home and get some sleep. Hank, I tried to argue but he arched his brow and crossed his arms. Right. I'll see you tomorrow. I was at the back door about to head out, when he repeated my name. Thanks by the way, for saving an old man's ass. I smirked. Least I can do. There was a question in his eyes but he waved me off and I left the bar. The night was warm and I tugged up the sleeves of my shirt. The glow from the streetlight danced over the scars on my forearms. Forcing my gaze to steer clear of those blemishes, I climbed into my old beat-up red Chevy and headed for my apartment. By the time I was inside the tiny one-bedroom place I called home, I was wired. So much for getting any sleep. I kicked out of my black steel-toed boots, wiggling my toes in the carpet. My tight black pants went next, and I let out a sigh of relief at the cold air of my apartment. The shirt went too, and I traipsed into the tiny galley kitchen to snag a bottle of beer from the fridge. Resting against the counter, I wondered about the fight again. What if those guys came back? What if next time they didn't just start a fist fight? Cursing about what kind of trouble I might have brought down on Hank's head, I sank onto my beat-up bright blue couch, flipped on the TV, and failed to stem the concern coursing through me. Why are you so worried? About time we had some excitement in our life again. Something to get our blood pumping and see what we can really do. Grunting I dragged one of the throw pillows over my head, ignoring my inner voice. Excitement was the last thing I wanted. That's what I told myself. Too bad deep down, I didn't believe it. The day after the bar brawl, I kept an eye out for the three guys coming back. Each time the door opened, I waited for them to appear, but they never did. It was a bit early for the Saturday night crowds to start, and I kept myself busy. Hank had been distracted when I got there that afternoon. Zane had kept watching me out of the corner of his eye. They were both driving me crazy, but I didn't say a word. Jerry and Vic arrived around five, and after I poured them their whiskeys, noted the few others who'd appeared. The same demon from last night was back at the corner table. His gaze danced over me a few times, but other than that, he stayed planted in his chair, checking his phone every few seconds. If he believed I wasn't human, he would have come for me by now, right? Maybe he'd miss the fight after all, and I was safe. He won't take your soul, my inner voice piped up. You can't know that. It's what they do. I just know. Can't you feel it? Feel what? I stared at the demon across the room, wondering what I was supposed to be sensing, when a weird familiarity hit me. It wasn't merely from his coming in here the past few nights. This was stronger and deeper. I knew him, and yet I didn't know him. Demons were in this bar all the time. How had I never experienced this before? I was halfway down the bar, ready to go and speak with him, until I realized what I was doing. What is this? I told you, you're getting stronger, the voice whispered. This doesn't make any sense. If the voice had any more answers for me, she neglected to share them and fell silent. Great. Just one more confusing puzzle piece to add to my already messed up life. I chanced a glance at the demon every second I could. The anger I was so used to being constant inside of me gave way to a comfortable warmth. The last time I'd experienced that was with my mother. And yet, this demon, why did he make me feel like I was finally coming home? His gaze shifted to me, and my hands clenched around the edge of the counter. Another face flickered through my mind and I gasped. It was a demon, but he was different. His eyes. 
his eyes were like mine. I blinked, and the image faded. The demon glanced away, leaving me reeling. What just happened? Heart pounding and the rest of me jittery, as if I downed a gallon of espresso, I lowered my head and went back to cutting limes. I nearly sliced my finger open twice, and had to stop to catch my breath and ensure my hand stopped shaking so violently. What was happening to me? A figure approached the bar while my head was down. Putting on a fake smile out of habit, I said, Welcome to Hank's Hideaway. What can I get you? They were right. You are a pretty thing, a rough voice replied. I jerked my head up and forced the smile to stay on my face. The fourth man, the one who usually joined the three from last night, stood in front of me, resting his forearms on the bar. A scar ran from the corner of his right eye to his cheek, red and jagged. He was a big guy, bigger than Hank, and his dark brown eyes narrowed while they raked over me. My gut twisted, and I gripped the small knife in my hand. I'd seen my fair share of bastards over the years. None of them had me thinking one specific word just from a look, but he did. Evil. His lips curled in a sneer, and the bar suddenly seemed too damn small. What are you drinking tonight? I asked, hoping he'd order a damn beer and go away. Nothing on the menu. I came here for something a little different. Giving up on the smile, I backed away, putting more distance between us. I clenched the knife harder, trying to remember why stabbing this guy's arm was a bad idea. Then I'm afraid I can't help you. There's the door. You can see yourself out. I called Zane and motioned to the man in front of me. He's ready to leave. Zane approached the man and tapped him on the shoulder. Let's go, man. I'm not leaving yet, the man said, his eyes narrowing on me. Not until I get what I want. Not that kind of place. Zane grabbed his arm and the guy slammed Zane's head into the bar. I cursed, watching Zane slump to the floor with a groan. Those nearby jumped to their feet, eyeing the man who merely adjusted his dark brown leather jacket as if he hadn't assaulted someone. Let's try this again. You're coming with me, he insisted with a smile that chilled me. I aimed the knife at him, my face on fire while I gritted my teeth. Get out or I'm calling the cops, I warned when the door to the back opened, and Hank rushed out. What the hell is going on out here? He demanded, hurrying around the bar. Jerry and Vic were already on their feet. The demon in the corner remained seated, though his eyes were glued to the one who'd attacked Zane. I called out to Zane, but there was no reply. I wanted to phone for an ambulance, but taking my eyes off the attacker seemed like a bad idea. Even with Hank yelling at him, he kept his focused gaze on me. What did he want? I wasn't anyone special. Shit, I was no one. And there's that denial again, my inner voice chimed in unhelpfully. Just a misunderstanding, the man told Hank. I need to have a chat with your bartender here. You need to leave, Hank snapped. Now. He shoved the stranger, but he didn't budge, not an inch. The man had no visible horns, so he couldn't be a demon. Hank grabbed him by the shoulders and pushed harder, until the stranger threw him across the room, knocking several tables to the floor with a crash. Shouting, I lunged forward with the knife. The man snatched it from my hand and threw it to the floor. The baseball bat Hank kept under the bar was right in front of me. I grabbed it, ready to smack the guy across the face with it, when he leaned over the bar, catching my wrist in a steel-like grip. I winced but heat rushed through me, and I bared my teeth at him. Let go asshole. Our faces were inches apart. His breath stunk of beer and something ungodly sweet that made me gag. His eyes searched mine and his grip tightened until I yelped. Jerry shouted at him to let me go, and that the cops were on their way, but he ignored him. Such eyes, the man murmured almost in awe. They were right. I had no idea what he was talking about, and wasn't going to wait around to find out. Hank was behind him again and tried to tear the man away from me. Letting me go he whipped around, grabbed Hank by the throat and squeezed. Shouting furiously, I climbed over the bar and aimed the bat at the guy's head. His hand caught it and he whirled on me, dropping Hank. Using the bat, he shoved me into the counter. The sharp edge dug into my spine, and I kicked at his shin, hoping to make him back off. So much for my having gotten stronger. 
You should make this easy and just come with me, he whispered. Screw you, I snapped. A burst of heat erupted in my abdomen. I shoved him and he flew across the room. He smashed into the far wall, falling to the floor in a heap. Shaking his head with a grunt, he hauled himself upright and stumbled to the door. The glare in his eyes said this wasn't over. I flipped him off. He ran out, the door slamming behind him. I reached for Hank's hand, helping him up while Jerry and Vic checked on Zane, telling him the paramedics and cops were on their way. You all right? I asked Hank. He blinked at me then at the wall where the guy had hit, leaving a dent in the corrugated metal that lined the wall. How did you do that? Does it matter? I mumbled, not wanting him to know how hard it was for me not to chase the guy down and finish what he started. Hank opened his mouth, but whatever he was going to say never made it out past his lips. He shook his head then hugged me. You're shaking. I'll live. I glanced at the door and gulped, my skin prickling with unease. He wanted me to go with him. Who the hell is he? I don't know but he's not getting back in here. Why don't you take a break, huh? Go hang out in my office for a few minutes while we sort this mess out. I didn't want to, but the stern scowl on his face said he wasn't giving me a choice. I walked to the back room where Hank's office was, stopping at the door when I realized the bat was still clutched in my hand. Gripping the fat end of it in my other hand, I pried my fingers loose and froze. There, where my hand had been was a burned imprint of it. The wood was smoking, and when I touched it, I found it hot as if I'd held a flame to it. I had to be seeing things. My mind was a mess from what that guy said to me, and how he'd looked at me. The mark on the bat didn't fade, and after another few seconds I looked up, sensing eyes on me. It was the demon who'd been sitting in the corner, stood by the front door. His heavy brow furrowed when he glanced from me to the bat and back again. He gave his head a little shake and ducked out the door. I rushed into Hank's office, slamming the door shut behind me. Fumbling for the pack of cigarettes I kept in Hank's desk for the bad nights, I pulled one out and lit it, hoping it'd calm me down. Instead, I ended up pacing around the small office space, failing to convince myself that the trouble from the last two days was over. It looks like we can't outrun our destiny after all, the voice murmured. I froze. There couldn't be a connection. It had been nearly a decade. How could they have found me? I didn't even know who they were. Rubbing my forehead hard enough to hurt, I told myself everything was fine. Everything was going to be just fine. Chapter 3 Samazrael Hef and I exited the portal he created. Hot dry air slapped me in the face. This place? Hef waved his hand behind us, and the portal to hell closed with a loud pop. What's wrong with Turquoise Falls? How about the name? I muttered, glaring at the desert expanse stretching out for miles in all directions except to the north. There, several tall buildings stretched into the sky, surrounded by the rest of the city that sprawled in a random pattern. Why anyone lived in this forsaken place was beyond me. You see any waterfalls? Or water, for that matter. What human names a city in the middle of the damn desert after falls? Nice to see your chipper attitude hasn't changed after your time down there, Hef said sarcastically clapping me hard on the shoulder. Why are we here? You'll see soon enough. Don't you trust me? He set off through the densely packed sands and dried shrubs toward the only sign of civilization in any direction. You stand out here too long, you'll burn. Bearing my fangs at his back, I glared at the sun beating down on the desert and followed him. The closer we came to the city, the more my nose twitched, and I growled. It reeks, I complained. Always does here, he replied, not slowing. I tried not to breathe through my nose, avoiding the bitter stench of sin drifting from the city. We hit the main drag, and I tensed at so many people crowding the sidewalks. Their chattering voices and excited laughter set my teeth on edge. I clenched my fists at my sides, ignoring the flashing lights trying to lure people into another casino or bar to spend their money. Hef eased through the masses, seemingly not bothered by the cesspool he brought me to. As a personal guard to Lucifer, 
I've been able to avoid places like this. When I was younger, I was on soul collecting duty and making deals, but that was over 250 years ago. Most of my time had been spent at Lucifer's side and going with him to collect souls after they'd already been taken. No one seemed disturbed by two demons strolling down the sidewalk. A few bumped into me, not bothering to apologize. I snarled, ready to teach them a lesson when Hef snagged my arm. Don't. Most of these people are drunk. The others are high. Let it go. I wrenched my arm free, staring in disgust at the throngs of sinners everywhere I looked. They aren't even surprised to see us. Why should they be? This is one of the highest yielding cities for souls. Let's get moving. We're almost there. He took off again. I had no choice but to follow. Since leaving my cell in hell, the voices that taunted me had dulled. They weren't gone, not entirely. When it was quiet enough, I'd catch them whispering, reminding me of my failure and the blood on my hands. At least, they had been quiet until we stepped foot in this godforsaken city. The sins of each human I passed reached out and brushed against me, letting me know their souls were ripe for the taking. And their sins called to mine, the only sin I ever committed. Failure, you'll always be a failure. You let her die. You let them both die. You're weak. Useless. Pathetic. I growled, startling the man speeding to get around me. When I glared, he took off at a run, and Hef shot me a look over his shoulder. What? I snapped. Hef kept silent. He took a left at the next corner, and I stuck close to him, not wanting to lose him in the crowd. The voices continued their chant, the words bouncing around my skull until my head throbbed. I cringed, muttering for them to be quiet. The overwhelming sensation that I shouldn't be here dragged me to a sudden stop in the middle of the sidewalk. I shut my eyes, fighting every instinct screaming at me to turn around and return to hell. A firm hand squeezed my arm. I opened my eyes, and Hef's stern look told me he wasn't about to let me run away. You'll want to see this. Trust me. See what? I demanded but he'd already let me go and took off again. Hef. Trust me, he replied, not slowing. He took a right at the next street and another one. When I spotted the demon standing about twenty yards away, I tensed. You're not in your cell anymore, Hef reminded me quietly. He's not going to try and kill you. Maybe he should. Hef glared but didn't stop until we reached the demon. He held out his arm and the demon took it. He looked familiar, but I couldn't place his face. Alron, my friend. I flinched. Alron. I hadn't seen him since before I was locked in the ninth level of hell. He hadn't aged a day, which wasn't surprising. Demons lived for thousands of years. My time in the cell might have felt like centuries, but seeing his face confused me in the strangest way. Why had Lucifer released me from my cell ten years ago? Ten years was barely a blink. Did he not lose all faith in me, as I feared? Hef, Alron said, then shifted his dark eyes to me. So, Mazrael, about time you let yourself out. Mind blank, I took the arm he offered and squeezed it. When I released it, worry flashed through his eyes. Tell Samazrael what you told me, Hef said. All of it. Yes, all of it. I glanced between them at their short exchange attempting to understand why Hef dragged me to this city of all places. And why did they both appear so on guard? Alron had been tense, as if bracing for an attack since the second I spotted him. Hef kept his head on a swivel, his eyes continually roving over the crowd of humans. Granted there were fewer on this side street away from the more touristy bars, but still enough to make me uneasy. Their sins permeated the air, pulsing around me like a living, breathing beast. The curse of being a demon meant feeling the sins of humans, no matter how big or small. Growling filled my ears. Belatedly, and after noticing Hef and Alron giving me varying looks of concern, I realized it came from me. Sorry, I muttered, giving my full attention to Alron. A few weeks back, I ducked into that bar, he said, nodding to a place called Hank's Hideaway a few doors down from where we stood. 
than to just grab a beer, but the bartender, there's something off about her. Off in what way? I ask. And since when is that the job of a demon? Why not point her out to a fallen and move on? Or kill her and take her soul like we're supposed to do? Why don't you take a look yourself instead of my giving you all the details, he suggested. Think you might understand my hesitation better then. Let you make up your own mind. He headed for the bar, half at his side. Glowering at the backs of their heads, I muttered several harsh curses in the demonic tongue and stormed after them. This was why Hef dragged me from my punishment. To see a human with supernatural abilities. Dealing with them had never been one of my tasks, and I was grateful for it. Making deals and collecting souls was one thing. Judging whether a human born with magical abilities would be an asset or a threat was not a weight I wanted on my shoulders. Years in a cell hadn't changed that. The fallen angels who patrolled the surface handled most cases before we ever found out about them. Many, they recruited to join their ranks. Others weren't so lucky. If their souls weren't pure enough, if they were darkened with too much sin or the potential to cause harm, they were executed. Lucifer's stance on supernatural humans was to kill them on the spot. Those human souls gave a boost of power to the millions already fueling the hellfire of the underworld. I tried to peer in the windows at the front door to the bar, but they were tinted, and I couldn't make anything out. Alron walked in first, and I brought up the rear of our small party. It was late afternoon, and the bar was relatively empty. Two of the high top tables had several bearded men in leather biker vests nursing beers. They paid us little attention, while we strode to another table in the far corner. Several other men and two women occupied the bar itself, all looking like they just got off work at one of the local strip joints, judging by revealing and glittery outfits that hardly passed for clothing. Alron said he'd snag us some drinks and strode to the bar. I glanced around the dimly lit space, grimacing at the neon lights of beer and liquor names covering the walls. A few pictures were scattered here and there, most of them depicting a large bear of a man with a long beard, who I assumed was Hank. The table we sat at was sticky, and my lip twitched in disgust. I kept my hands curled in my lap while I sat back in my chair. What am I looking for? I asked Hef. That bartender Alron's talking to is a guy, and I feel nothing from him but his sins. Patience, Hef replied. Enjoy your first day back on the surface. In the worst city possible. His eyes darkened. Whatever he'd been about to say was cut off when Alron returned with three beers. He joined us at the table and lifted his drink to me. Cheers to freedom. Nothing freeing about it, I whispered and drained the hoppy beer in one go. Hef and Alron talked about the city and how much it had changed over the years. I half listened too busy internally yelling at the voices in my head to shut up. They prattled on and on, until I was digging my quickly lengthening claws into my thigh to stop myself from flipping the table in my rush to leave this place. I never should have left hell. I never should have listened to Hef. Nothing about this trip to the surface was worth. I sucked in a harsh breath at the formidable presence surrounding me like a swirling hot wind. Wildly, I searched the bar, swearing Lucifer had to be here somewhere. Only he wasn't. Hef and Alron had stopped talking, now watching me intently. They shifted in their chairs, clearly feeling what I did, but it didn't appear to affect them as severely. Blinking rapidly, I struggled to breathe, attempting to understand what I felt. Not Lucifer, but if not him, then who was putting off such an intense aura? The longer it pulsed around me, the more I realized how familiar it was. I'd been around this presence years ago. A presence I believed I'd never feel again. A woman's voice rang out, followed by laughter that jolted me as if I'd been struck by lightning. I stiffened in my chair, zeroing in on where the sound came from. Across the room, and standing behind the bar, was a woman wearing a long sleeve black shirt bearing a silver crow on the front. She was wiping down glasses. Her bright smile was fake, but it wasn't her mouth I focused on. Those shimmering silver eyes, I'd only ever seen eyes that color on one other being. Lucifer. 
Those were his eyes shining with such life and energy. Such power. She turned, and I caught a glimpse of her silver streaked black hair, half up, half down, and held back with a small black clip. When she spun around, I took in the soft curves of her cheeks, the dimple that appeared in her right one when she grinned. At her left temple was the tiniest mark shaped like a flame. Her gaze wandered through the bar. When it settled on me, she went utterly still. Her cheeks turned red, and she swayed as if dizzy. She grabbed the counter in front of her, a question in those silver depths that glistened. She gave her head a shake, and her gaze moved on. For those few seconds, I hadn't breathed. My body went numb, and I rose from my chair with the insane urge to rush to her side. So, Masrael. Hef whispered, grabbing my arm. It's her, I breathed. She's alive. How is she alive? You're certain. Half acts. I growled, drawing the attention of the others in the bar. How can you ask me that? The last time you saw her, she was a baby in a crib, he reminded me calmly. It's her, I stated through gritted teeth, confused by the storm of emotions bombarding my mind. Relief that she was alive was quickly followed by guilt, heartache, and a rage so fierce, it had me placing my hands flat on the table to stop myself from losing control. She was here, and she was alive. She didn't appear to have been harmed, either. How was this possible? The voices inside my head that had been chattering about my failure shifted gears. Now they were angry, right along with me, hissing that this woman, Lucifer's daughter I'd sworn to protect, was responsible for my years of torment. I'd had plenty of time to contemplate what horrors might have befallen her. How she'd been killed along with a fallen angel, Dahlia, her mother. The horrors I'd conjured had been half the reason I refused to leave my cell, unsure of what anguish she'd been made to suffer at such a young age. And yet there she stood, smiling and laughing as if she hadn't suffered at all. But I had. I'd suffered every minute of every day since coming to and finding her crib covered in blood, and her gone. Have you told anyone else she's here? Hefax Alron. No one. I wasn't sure what to think at first. How could you not realize who she is by her aura alone? I demanded. Alron's forehead crinkled, and he shrugged. Whatever your feeling must not be as strong for me. I sense power, but nothing of hell. Honestly, it was her eyes I noticed first. Her aura wasn't this noticeable a week ago. After what she did yesterday, though, it's changed. And seeing your reaction, he told me, makes me believe it's her. Ashmiel. Lost daughter of Lucifer. What happened yesterday? I ax, unable to look away from Ashmiel. Guy came in causing trouble. It looked like he was trying to get her to leave the bar. He went after the owner and the bouncer. She threw him clear across the room, burned a handprint into the bat she was holding at the time. Seemed pretty shocked by it all. She doesn't know who she is. I ax, brow furrowing. How? No idea, but I bet it has something to do with why she turned up in a dive bar. Alron stood and squeezed my shoulder. Besides, it's not my place to speak to her. It's yours. What? I snapped lowering my voice when I drew curious looks. I can't talk to her. Why not? Lucifer assigned you to be her bodyguard the moment she was born. She might have been lost, but now she's back. Your oath to protect her stands. Alron gave me an encouraging smile, but all I did was glare right back at him. She's alive. You should be celebrating. My lip twitched, and I sat down, hunching over the table. No matter how much I wanted to argue with him, he was right. The oath I swore to Lucifer had not been broken as I'd thought. Not as if I could simply walk over there and take her to hell, not if she had no idea who or what she was. Informing her of her lineage would take delicate work, finesse, something I was not good at, especially after what I'd been through. The taunting voices bouncing around my skull reminded me of how unstable I'd become. How was I supposed to even uphold my oath if I lost what sliver of control I still had? She would be safer on her own with no one knowing who she was. The moment I told her the truth and stepped into her life, 
she'd be in danger from those who might want to harm Lucifer's daughter. Alron and Hef left me at the bar after hanging around for an hour or so. They'd ask if I was going, but I hadn't been able to tear myself away from the table. I'd peeled the label from the beer bottle a while ago, ripping it into tiny pieces while I listened to Ashmiel. She sounded exactly as I'd imagined she would after she'd grown up. Closing my eyes, I tuned out the noise from the bar and focused only on her voice. The smoky timbre flowed over me like a soothing rain, easing the tension from my shoulders and the rest of my muscles. The laughter that came from her might have been without emotion, but that voice, I could listen to her speak all night long. I hadn't heard anything sound so appealing in years. I stopped listening to the words, not caring what she said as long as she kept talking. Her powerful aura pulsed through the bar. These humans were oblivious to it, but I wasn't. Unlike Lucifer's sharp emotions that had stabbed at me, hers pulsated like the beating of her heart. Sometimes faster, sometimes slower, but always there. I waited to sense her emotions as I did Lucifer's, but they felt too far away to get a good read on. Was there a chance she did know who she was, and she was keeping everything held back so I wouldn't sense her? Does it matter? You should kill her, one of the voices whispered, breaking through the calm. Why would I do that? I gave my oath to protect her. Yeah, and because of it, you were tortured. Look at you. You're nothing now. You're barely a shadow of your former self. Pathetic and twisted. Weak. You'll always be weak. Kill her and live your life for you. You know it's what you really want. A growl rumbled through my body, silencing the voice. I didn't want to kill Ashmiel. I wouldn't. And yet, the idea was planted. How easy would it be for me to walk up to the bar and rip her throat out? If she didn't know what she was, she didn't know how to use the power surging through her veins. Demons were hard to kill, but we weren't immortal. I dragged my claws across the table, seeing the moment play out in my mind. Easy, it would be so easy, and my suffering would finally be ended. I could disappear, live off the souls of humans. Never have to see Lucifer or Hell again. A flash of Ashmiel's dead body appeared in my mind's eye. I jumped up from my chair at the same time a hand landed on my shoulder. Hey, sorry. Ashmiel stood to my right, her hand hovering near my arm. You seemed a bit out of it. You all right? Clenching my jaw, I nodded. Okay. Ah, uh, the bar's closing, she told me, her silver eyes searching my face. A flush crept up her neck to her cheeks, and those silver eyes gave off a subtle glow. You good to get yourself home, wherever home is? Hell, I guess. It'd be hell, but if not, let me know if you need me to call you a cab. Don't need a cab, I murmured. Right. Guess demons can't get drunk. She licked her lips. I watched the motion, the temperature in the bar rising. Have a good night then. She made no move to walk away. Her aura pulsed faster around me, and I didn't want to leave her side. How could I ever believe I could harm this woman? Her hand fell to my arm. Clarity, unlike any I'd experienced since the night of the attack, shot through me. The scars from my years of punishment remained, but they were dulled by the bomb that was Ashmiel's touch. The heat emanating from her palm would have been enough to burn a human. To me, it was a touch I longed to feel. I wasn't the only one sensing a comforting strangeness from this moment, judging by her wrinkled brow and her parted lips. Too damn soon, she pulled her hand back, taking with it the relief from my shattered soul her presence brought me. Ashmiel, she said roughly. Coughing, she held out her hand and repeated, Ashmiel. Nice to meet you. I shook her hand, noting how she caught her tongue between her teeth at the contact, her face turning a darker shade of red. So, Mazrael, I hope this isn't the only time you come here. You bringing those dishes, girly? Or what? A gruff voice called from the back room. Like to get home sometime tonight. Ashmiel yelled back, don't get your panties in a twist. She smirked and turned to me. See you around, Samazrael. She gathered up the empty bottles from my table, 
gave me one last curious glance, and hurried to the bar. I took my chance and bolted, rushing out into the night, gasping for air, until I was dizzy. Stumbling into an alley, I leaned against a brick wall. What just happened back there? Being able to feel her aura wasn't what had thrown me. What she did to me, that's what I didn't understand. Rubbing a hand down my face, I strained to hold on to the calm she brought me, but it slipped from my grasp. I sank to the ground, clutching my head in my hands, shaking. The desire to rush back inside the bar, to be near her, forced me to my feet. I was halfway there, before I realized what I was doing. This wasn't right. Nothing about this was. I couldn't be the one to protect her, not in this unhinged state. One minute I wanted to protect her, and the next I pictured her dead. I don't see the problem, the harsh voice said. Shut up, I snarled. Just shut up. Why should I? It's what you want. Deep down, buried in the darkness of your soul, you know it's true. Kill her, some Azrael. Kill her and save yourself. I shouted, burying my fist in the brick wall. The pain chased away the voice. My hand hurt like a bitch, but it had healed. I stalked down the alley and wove my way through the city until I was in the desert. I had no idea what my next move was. All I knew was I had to see Ashmiel again. Hopefully, a plan would come to me of how to proceed. Until then, all I could do was pray I wouldn't end up killing her. Chapter 4 Ashmiel Glass shattered and I jumped, cursing. The pint glass I'd been attempting to put on a tray was now on the floor, its contents covering my legs and the rubber mat behind the bar. Carefully, I picked up the bigger shards, tossed them in the bin, and went to grab the dustpan and the small broom. What's going on with you? Hank Axe, standing over me while I cleaned up the mess. No idea what you're talking about. That's the third glass you've dropped. Tonight. I think it's a record. Can't even remember a time you broke anything in this place. I shrugged, then he was hauling me to my feet and giving me that damned concerned fatherly look of his. I'm all right, really. Just need a smoke break. I shrugged again. His eyes narrowed. I scowled at him. What? I said I was working on quitting. I am. Just not right now. That shit will kill you. Thanks, I had no idea, I muttered sarcastically, and he crossed his arms. Cheeks burning, I gave him a sheepish smile. Sorry. Ever since that asshole was in here, I felt off, you know? Keep waiting for him to come back. Him or the other ones. Haven't been sleeping much either. I told you to come crash at my place if you needed to. I'm not going to put you out like that. Bad enough you see me here every single day, I teased, trying to keep my tone light. I'm good. Really? His huff said he didn't believe me. I was saved by one of the regulars calling his name to get my attention. Hank helped me clean up the rest of my mess and let me be behind the bar. It wasn't only the anxiety of that bastard returning to try and kidnap me that had me out of sorts. It was the strange demon who showed up three nights ago and had been back every night since. I hadn't been able to stop thinking about him since our first encounter. Unlike with the demon from the other night, Samizrael's presence did more than reach out to me. It had grabbed hold of me and yanked me entirely out of myself. For the first time in years, the anger that was always coiled and ready to lash out had diminished. Instead, I'd been caught off guard by the gentle touch of a hand brushing across my cheek. Everything about that caress was right. I felt grounded in who I was meant to be. With it came a fierce need to speak with the demon holding my gaze so steadily. I never expected Samazrael to show back up, but he had. I hadn't spoken to him any more. Part of me said to go strike up a conversation. The other part wanted to see what he'd do it. If he'd eventually make his way to the bar to talk to me. That first night he'd seemed so out of it, lost almost, until I touched his arm. Whatever fog had clouded his mind appeared to lift. I wasn't even sure why I'd approached him in the first place. Usually, I let Zane get everyone moving toward the door. 
Yet something about some Azrael had said I needed to go over there. What was weirder was for those few seconds, the emptiness that was an old friend to my anger disappeared. Comforting warmth filled me instead, as if some Azrael created a fire right inside my soul. The confusion on his face had matched what I felt until he blinked, and those sea-green eyes turned cold and distant. I'd meant to talk to him again after I dropped the dishes off in the back, except he'd left by the time I returned. Not that I had to worry, since he was here once again, sitting at the corner table. Even with my head down while I absently wiped the bar with a clean rag, I sensed him watching me. The first time I'd spotted him, he'd been with two other demons. One of those had been present when the fight broke out at the bar. For the last few days, some Azrael had been sitting at the same damn table by himself, drinking beer into the night. Watching. Always just watching. He didn't talk to anyone. Didn't disturb anyone. Admittedly, his presence made me feel safer, not that I could explain why. The concern I had about a demon killing me for not being normal was no longer present. He hadn't come here to murder me. I had no idea why he was here, but it wasn't to see me dead. Sam Israel's gaze continually shifted from that cold, distant look to one that was confused and even angry. Whatever he was going through, keeping a close eye on me was apparently more important. If that guy and his crew came back with some Azrael here, they'd be on their asses in a shot. My gut told me, he wasn't about to let anything happen to me. I debated taking him a drink on the house simply to be close to him again. Just stop while you're ahead. Things are weird enough right now as it is, I told myself. I'd been shaky ever since I saw my handprint burned into the bat, on edge. Every little sound made me jump out of my skin now, but it wasn't just about the guy who tried to hurt Hank and me, and actually did hurt Zane. Something inside of me had changed. I was restless, like something alive was rushing through my veins wanting to get out. Sleeping was a struggle now, too. My dreams were so vivid but all I ever saw was fire, its heat pressing in around me. I'd wait for the pain, but there never was any, even while the flames coursed over my body in endless waves of orange and red. A couple of times after I'd bolted awake, I swore I'd seen two faces staring back at me through the fire. One of them had been a woman. I thought it might be my mother, but her face was too obscured to see. The figure beside her had horns and massive wings that spread out wide behind them both. Last night though, last night there'd only been one figure. He too had horns but there'd been no wings, and his outline had been different. He'd reached out to me, and I'd felt that same soft touch at my cheek. I wanted to believe it was Samazrael. The familiarity I had in the dream was exactly what I had right then. I'd never met him before, I was sure of it, so why was my mind telling me I knew him? Because it's Samazrael, you idiot. I rolled my eyes at my inner voice. What's so wrong with that? Admit it. He's sexy as hell and you like him. Who cares if you're dreaming about him? Besides, he makes you feel something. When was the last time that happened? It's not a good idea, I muttered to myself. You're the only one standing in the way. He wouldn't keep coming back if he didn't like the view. You can't deny what you feel toward him is way stronger than with those other demons. There's a reason for that, don't you think? I threw the bar rag over my shoulder and busied myself with work, ignoring the scolding I was mentally giving myself. I went about my evening, making drinks and chatting with the people at the bar. Needing to use the restroom, I stepped away for a few minutes and ducked down the hall. At the sink I splashed water on my face, wondering why I was so flushed. It was warm in the bar, but not this warm. I brushed it off as a random blistering flash from my ever-present anger or my mind incessantly drifting to Sam Israel's rugged, stern face and left the bathroom. I was pulling the sleeves down on my shirt when I froze. Sam Israel's intimidating figure blocked the hall, his sea-green eyes giving off a subtle glow in the dim lighting. A tick started in his jaw and he breathed heavily in and out through his nose. I was going to ask him if he was all right when I realized his eyes weren't looking at me. Or at least not my face. Quickly, I dragged my sleeves down the rest of the way. In three long strides, he closed the distance between us, 
grabbed my wrist far gentler than I expected, and shoved the fabric back up. I tugged my arm back, but his grip didn't budge. The scars on my forearm were hard to see in this light. From the way he scowled, he saw them just fine. Let go, I snapped, hating how weak my voice sounded right then. He lifted his head, and his gaze pierced me right to my core. No. Samazrael, I said, but he growled, and I clamped my mouth shut. I waited for my anger to explode, but nothing happened. It remained tightly coiled in my stomach. I shifted closer, not sure what made me do it. I needed to be nearer to him. That's all I knew. His thumb gently caressed the sensitive skin near my wrist, and I tensed. A spike of white hot fire shot down my spine. No one touched those scars. Ever. As if waking from a dream, I yanked my arm away with enough force to break Samizrael's hold. I pulled my sleeves down so abruptly that one of the cuffs tore at the seam. Do you mind? I snapped, the comforting peace I'd felt from him seconds ago turning into a raging inferno while I glared. What happened to you? It doesn't matter. It was a long time ago. Matters to me. I crossed my arms tightly over my chest and took a step back. Why? Why do you keep coming to the bar? What do you want? Who said I wanted anything, he replied quietly. Your eyes. Every time you look at me. He straightened, the glow to his eyes brightening for a second until they dimmed. Tell me how you got those scars. No, I said, attempting to give him the same piercing glower he'd given me. From the way his brow arched, it didn't have the same effect. Letting out a heavy sigh, I edged around him and out of the hall and marched back behind the bar. I turned around to tend to the few regulars there and cursed. Samazrael had followed me and stood there tapping his claws on the counter. Vic and Jerry were in their usual spots. I caught them glancing from Samazrael to me, then back to the demon. Ignoring them, I asked Samazrael if he wanted another drink. He said nothing, but I plopped a beer on the counter in front of him anyway. On the house, I said with a bright smile. He picked up the beer and set it to the side. I did my best to pretend he wasn't standing only a few feet away, watching me like he usually did from across the room. Absently, I rearranged liquor bottles and wiped down glasses that were already spotless. No matter what I did to keep myself busy, my eyes constantly darted back to Samazrael. And he didn't move a damn muscle, mostly. That tick in his jaw seemed to be getting worse. A couple of times I caught his eyes dart to my arms, and I nearly hurled a glass at his head to make him stop. I turned my back on him, hoping it'd help. Too bad it didn't. Our eyes locked in the mirror hanging on the wall, and the rest of the bar disappeared like it wasn't there. He stood directly behind my right shoulder, tall and strong. It wasn't hard to imagine what his wings would look like, spread out behind him. His eyes glowed even brighter, and his mouth parted enough for me to see a hint of his sharp fangs. With every second that passed, I kept expecting to finally feel fear creeping in that he was here to harm me like so many others in my life had been. Samazrael wasn't merely a demon from hell. There was far more to him. He was dangerous. Deadly. I should have been running in the other direction. Only I didn't. I wanted him, and that want stole the air from my lungs. His eyes flared and he leaned forward, reaching for my shoulder. Inches away from touching me, a shadow passed through his eyes. With a snarl, he yanked his hand back, turned and exited the bar. The chatter of the customers filled my ears again. I spun around. Vic and Jerry eyed me curiously. What? I asked, refilling their glasses with whiskey. My hand shook, while another heated flash almost had me almost tugging my sleeves up. I stopped myself in time, not wanting anyone else to see my scars tonight. Hank was the only other person who knew about them. Why did Samazrael get so angry about them? Flushed and trembling more, I poured myself a shot of whiskey and drained it. You know that demon? Vic acts. Not really. Aha. Uh -huh. It seems like he knows you pretty well. Well he doesn't, I told Vic. Just passing through. Jerry hesitated, looked ready to say something about it too, but I walked away, not giving him a chance. 
The remainder of the evening passed with me in a daze. Pretending everything was okay was easy since I did it all the time. I took care of the final tab and watched the customer head for the door. Zane locked it behind him, and I did my closing tasks fast as I could. Hank commented on my rushing around like a madwoman and asked if I was all right. After assuring him I was, I headed home, unable to stop thinking about Samazrael and that look he'd given me right before that weird change came over him. Later that night, while I laid on the couch aimlessly flipping through TV channels, my thoughts were still on Samazrael. I'd never paid much attention to the demons who passed through Turquoise Falls, but it was hard to ignore this one when he watched me as he did. Those sea-green eyes of his reminded me of a lagoon, not that I'd ever been to one. His messy hair around those obsidian horns had been various shades of brown and amber, like whiskey. His horns had a little curl at the ends, and were shorter than some others I'd seen. They didn't stick up straight or lay down flat, but were somewhere in between. There was a firm set to his jaw, and those sharp cheekbones completed his brutish appearance. He was covered in tribal markings that stretched to the underside of his chin and around his neck. His eyes came to mind again while mine drifted closed. His face might have been blank, but the unbridled emotions in those irises were palpable. There'd been so much agony and anger, hatred and disbelief, nothing about what I saw made sense. Nothing about what passed between us in that drawn-out few seconds did either. Then again, nothing about the last week seemed to be real. Not from the strange attack in the bar, or from Samazrael showing up. He was there for a reason, that's what my gut told me. But why did he only show up after those assholes did? Maybe they weren't merely thugs who were randomly hanging out in the bar. The idea that they were demon hunters passed through my mind, but that'd be ridiculous. Everyone knew how fanatical they were. Why would they even try to come to this city teeming with demons? The better question was, what did they want from me? I was nothing. Are you sure about that? Don't start, I mumbled to the voice in my head. I am merely pointing out that you are not, in fact, normal. Or nothing for that matter. Stop thinking so damn little of yourself. You made it through your own hell and survived. And now, something incredible is about to happen to you if you'd stop doubting everything for two seconds. I'm ignoring you and going to sleep. Grabbing another pillow to put under my head, I punched it a few times to get it right, laid back down and scrunched my eyes shut. After a while I dozed, the noise from the TV drifting to the background while my breathing steadied and my body relaxed. Maybe tonight, I'd actually get a decent night's sleep. I wasn't sure how much time had passed when I awakened, coughing harshly. I sucked in a breath only to gasp and sputter. My eyes burned from the thick smoke filling my apartment. A fire alarm screeched, and I rolled off the couch, fighting to get air into my lungs. Squinting and staying low, my brain caught up with what was happening, and I crawled for the front door. Outside my door, panic screams filled the night. Fumbling for the deadbolt, I turned it. When I tried to pull open the door, it wouldn't budge. Yanking on the handle with two hands did nothing except leave me in a gasping, cursing heap on the floor. Heat pressed in around me and I scrambled to get away from what I'd thought would be my escape. I barely made it to the couch again, when my front door exploded inward. My scream came out as a hoarse croak, and I buried my head under my arms. A second explosion sent flames rolling into my apartment, burning everything in their path. Debris fell around me, and a heavy beam pinned my legs. Grimacing from the impact, I laid there stunned. What are you doing? Get up. You have to move. Jolted from the screaming of my inner voice, I pushed at the beam but wasn't strong enough to shove it off. Flames crept closer, and the smoke was making it hard to think straight. I was going to pass out any second now. Probably for the best. The last thing I wanted was to feel those flames eating me alive. I shut my eyes, the immense heat a crushing weight. The fire had to be all around me. Bracing for the pain, I scrunched in on myself the best I could and waited. When no pain came and I was still somehow conscious, I frowned. Maybe I had passed out, and this was my brain trying to keep me from reacting to how bad my death was. Or I was already dead. Peeking an eye open, I tried again to scream. 
Flames were eating away at the sleeves of my shirt and my pants, but it didn't hurt. Why didn't it hurt? A crash sounded from behind me, and a figure appeared in the flames. Ashmiel. Samazrael. It had to be him. A rush of relief flooded me, and I attempted to call out to him. He walked through the fire without pause. When he sank down beside me, the fury in his now solid black eyes was comforting in ways I didn't stop to try and understand. His face had shifted, his brow furrowed and his fangs far longer than they'd been at the bar earlier that evening. Growling ferociously, he grabbed the wooden beam with his elongated claws and threw it off my legs. I cursed at the sharp pins and needles' pain, hoping they weren't broken. Black, leathery wings burst from Samizrael's back, surrounding me and blocking out the flames. With no effort at all, he scooped me into his arms, tucked my head against his heated chest and took off through the ceiling. Fresh air hit my face and I breathed it in gratefully. His wings carried us away from the apartment building, which was now engulfed in flames. He landed on the sidewalk, where most of the other residents were gathered. Carefully he set me on the ground, studying my face. His eyes drifted lower while he tentatively touched my shins. I winced, but I wasn't as hurt as I thought I should be. Weirder still was when I noticed that despite parts of my clothing having been burned away, the skin beneath wasn't burned. What? It was like the fire hadn't touched me at all. What's happening? I whispered. Samazrael drew attention from the people around us, and he rolled his shoulders, flashing fang at them until they glanced away. How did you know? I asked quietly. Samazrael. Sirens approached and he took a step back, his wings already fluttering, ready to take him into the sky. He seemed torn between staying and going. His head twitched, and snapping his jaws at me, he took off into the darkness, the gust from his wings flattening me to the sidewalk. And all I could do was watch him fly away. How had he known where to find me? Or that I was in trouble? I yelled his name, hoping he'd come back, but he was gone in seconds. Cursing I sat on the sidewalk, wondering why I wasn't dead. Still think you're nothing? I scowled, not acknowledging the words at all. The fire trucks and ambulances arrived shortly after Samazrael left. I was helped onto a gurney, even though I kept insisting I was okay. The paramedics checked me out all the same. I didn't miss the astonishing glance they exchanged when I didn't have a single burn on me. The only injury I had was bruising from where my legs had been crushed. I explained what happened inside, and the woman shook her head, muttering it was a damned miracle my legs weren't broken. You're one lucky chick, she mused. You should still go to the hospital for smoke inhalation. Just in case. Really, I'm okay. I don't want to go. Her lips thinned. Please don't make me argue with you. Better to be safe. I sighed but sat back down on the gurney. I stared at the apartment building, out the back of the ambulance. The flames were still raging, and black smoke billowed from the windows. Damn. I didn't own much, but what little I had was inside. None of it probably survived. Ashmiel. I spotted Hank running to me. He hauled himself into the ambulance and wrapped me in a bear hug. I'm all right, I assured him. Really? His eyes danced over my charred clothing. How? It's a long story. One you can tell me at my place. Until you find a new apartment, you're bunking with me. No arguing. Gave me a heart attack, girly. I puffed out my cheeks, thinking of a way not to be more of a burden to him, but gave up. The paramedic said, we had to go to the hospital first. Hank said he'd meet us there, gave me one more hug and climbed out of the ambulance. I watched the chaos out the back windows, once I was on my way to the hospital. I just lost everything, and somehow survived a fire that should have killed me. I waited for the adrenaline to wear off, and panic to set in. I'd been in terrible situations before, and was really good at keeping my shit together, until I knew I was safe. Then I'd fall apart. But no tears came this time, not even anger. The only thought I had while the paramedics drove me to the hospital was if I'd see some Azrael again. Chapter 5 Samazrael.
I landed a few miles from Ashmiel's apartment, snarling at the voices screeching at each other inside my skull. Slamming my hands to my ears, I bellowed for them to shut up. The few people nearby scattered at my outburst. The humans who stayed stared at me, some obviously under the influence of some drug or other. Flashing my fangs, I took off into the air again, flying until I reached the outskirts of the city. Crashing to the sands, I continued to snap my jaws and snarl, but the voices went on. Why did you save her? Should have let her burn, yes, she should have burned. That wouldn't work, she can't burn. She's his daughter. We should have slit her throat. Killed her. No, we had to save her. Protect her. We can't spill her blood, or Lucifer will kill us. We can't break our oath. I buried my hands in the sand, resting my head on the ground, unable to hear myself think. Around and around, the voices went. With my eyes shut, I pictured the fire and how it started. The men who did it were dead in an alley. I'd been too late to stop the flames from spreading, but they'd never harm another person. Their souls were already in hell, preparing to face their punishment for eternity. I'd overheard them talking about ensuring if she really was who they thought she was while I perched on a rooftop near Ashmiel's place. If she didn't die in the fire, they planned to snatch her off the sidewalk. Anyone else who perished in the fire was merely collateral damage to them. They'd laughed about taking innocent lives, sick bastards. I dispatched them, only afterward realizing keeping one of them alive would have been helpful in understanding who kept targeting Ashmiel. Shit. I thought I was going to be too late. If Ashmiel was a human, she'd be dead. But she wasn't. She was Lucifer's daughter, and the flames hadn't touched her. How had she gone her whole life not realizing she was different? That beam should have crushed her legs. Demons weren't invincible, but it was damn hard to wound us and leave scars. Like the scars on her arms. I snarled again, remembering those jagged lines crisscrossing her forearms. There'd been a few deeper ones, too. The one at her right wrist upset me the most. Had she done those to herself? She hadn't wanted me to see them. That much was evident from the daggers she glared at me. What occurred after that moment in the hall was what left me reeling. I hadn't merely been surrounded by her pulsing aura. Her emotions had cascaded over me like a waterfall, dousing me with what she'd been feeling at that exact moment. The confusion I expected, but everything else had rooted me to the spot. An old anger had hit me first, followed immediately by a longing so fierce it left me shaken even after I'd left the bar. I was sure I had to be imagining that last one. If I hadn't felt the same emotions all over again while I pulled her from the fire, I'd never have believed it. Attraction. She was attracted to me, even when I'd been enraged. When I snarled at her, she hadn't flinched. No, she'd wanted me to stay. How could she not see how dangerous I was? Couldn't she feel how close I was to losing the battle with the voices inside my head? I had to stay away from her. And the moment I thought it, I growled loudly at the idea of not going back to her. That, and she still didn't know the truth. I buried my fists in the sand, wishing I'd kept one of those men alive to take my anger out on. The more I thought of Ashmiel, the more her face manifested in my mind. Those silver eyes, so full of power and a fight to live that shimmered brightly. The presence of her aura lingered on my skin, and I focused on it. The voices quieted one by one in my head, until it was just me again. Or it was, until I realized how close Ashmiel came to being grievously wounded or captured tonight. Lucifer's enraged roar deafened me. I curled in on myself, waiting for the agony from the noise to go away. Instead of it fading as it usually did, his roar was cut off by a second, fiercer one, edged with a power. Ashmiel. The sudden quiet startled me, and I sat upright, glancing around the desert. Needing to get to hell and tell Hef what happened, I rose from the ground. I waved my hand, and two bright flames shot from my palm. They twisted around each other, and formed an arched doorway leading to hell. This was the only bit of fire I'd been able to use since leaving my cell. It wasn't nearly enough, 
but for now it was better than nothing. Relying on another demon to see me to and from hell would not have been ideal. I stepped through it, leaving the mortal plane behind. The dry heat from the underworld was a welcome balm to my skin. Hell might be where the sinners ended up, but I couldn't sense their sins unless I entered the levels. Being around humans for the past few days had been torture, but no worse than what I'd endured while locked in my cell. Anyway, it had been worth it to keep an eye on Ashmiel. Demons walked by me, not paying me any attention on their way to the surface or the levels to carry out their duties. I stood at the epicenter of the underworld. Beyond me stretched the city of Temesis, where the demons of hell resided. I was sure most humans believed we simply lived in fiery pits. Those were reserved for the sinners. Our homes were constructed of black stone that shone in the glamoured sky overhead that was always trapped somewhere between dusk and darkness. There was no sun not down here. But the sky was Lucifer's doing. Some said it was because he secretly loathed holding domain underground. One day, they whispered, he planned to break free and rule on the surface, but the fallen would never let that happen. All of heaven would rise up if he attempted to take over the mortal plane and forsake his oath to keep watch over the damned. I turned around, taking in the marketplace to my right, filled with vendors and shops selling weapons and exotic goods and even souls. When someone died, their soul was sent to either heaven or hell, it was true. Then there were those who made deals. When their time was up, a demon would collect their soul before its time, leaving the husk of a person left to wander the earth until their body finally died. These souls here were those taken without a deal. Lucifer outwardly condemned such practices as soul-stealing, but every demon knew as long as they weren't caught, Lucifer didn't care how many souls were pilfered. Humans were nothing but a source of power to him. And not all souls taken went to powering the flames of hell. I paused at the booth, unable to look away as a demon purchased a human soul, the ethereal outline of its former self hovering a few inches off the ground. The demon opened his mouth wide and sucked the helpless spirit into his being. I almost felt pity for the human. Almost. The demon shuddered, absorbing the life force, then let out a deep roar. When he opened his eyes, they were black with gold flecks shimmering in their depths. A long time ago, when I was a much younger demon, I'd swallowed a soul. The rush of power had been beyond intoxicating. Humans took drugs to get high, but demons we ate souls took their life force and melted it with ours. For hours afterward we were stronger, harder to kill, our fire far more potent. But as with any drug, eventually it wears off. Lucifer would never admit it, but many demons were addicted to swallowing souls. The Blackhearts were the king of hell's personal guard. They patrolled the underworld, were intended to keep the addicts in check. Before I'd been thrown in my cell, many of them had turned the other way. From the number of souls currently being sold and the demons lined up to devour them, that was still the case. You should take one, a whisper sounded in my mind. Do it. You'll need it. Taking souls will be the only way to keep her safe. To protect her. To not fail. Take it. Take a soul. You want it. You know you do. Lip twitching in disgust, I pushed onward past the market and toward the carved cave entrance that led to Hef's massive forge. The temperature rose drastically around the raging fires. Sweat broke out on my forehead while I glanced at the demons preparing new weapons. I axed a female demon for Hef, and she pointed me to the rear of the forge. Hef stood in front of a model of demon wings. The sleeves of his black shirt were rolled up, and sweat dripped down his face, though he didn't seem to care. A leather band held back his hair, drenched from the long hours he spent at the forges. He was working with clay, molding it into shape around the wings' joints. What's that? I ax. New project. Guards for the joints make them stronger. Added protection and a weapon if need be. He set the clay down and picked up a small carving tool. I was wondering if you'd ever return to us. Did you speak to her yet? Distractedly, I picked up a bit of the molding clay, tearing it apart in my hands and squishing it back together. Yes and no. If I told Hef about my encounter with Ashmiel, 
I wasn't sure what he'd do. I hadn't wanted to go to the surface to begin with. However, knowing she was up there now changed everything. I was a potential threat to her, but being away from her aura, which gave me such comfort, wasn't ideal. I grunted angrily, picturing another demon guarding her instead of me. So, Masrael, you going to share, or do I have to drag the answers out of you? It's complicated, I replied stiffly. Someone set her place on fire tonight. Likely to prove she's Lucifer's daughter, or to kill her if she wasn't. The voices clamored to be heard the second the words were out of my mouth. Cringing, I squeezed the clay in my hand, feeling it ooze through my fingers. And just as before, focusing on what little of Ashmiel's aura remained on my skin, chased them all back into the shadowy recesses of my mind. So, Masrael. Right, sorry. I cleared my throat and told Hef about the men sneaking around the apartment building and the fire they'd set. His eyes shifted to black when I told him how I found Ashmiel pinned in her apartment with a fire ready to destroy her. There can be no more denying who she is. I'm not the one who doubted, Hef said quietly. I tossed the ball of clay aside, stalking around the wing model. Was it wrong of me to hope it wasn't her? Doesn't matter now. It's her, and she needs to know who she is. Why haven't you gone to Lucifer? I demanded, whipping around and nailing him with a glare. He should know. The moment you thought it was her, he should have been alerted. Why hasn't he been? Why isn't he the one going to the surface to tell her? You know why, Hef replied quietly. She's his daughter. And he'll think it's a trap to draw him in. He might have loved her when she was born, but then she was stolen from him and it nearly destroyed him. Having a child became a weakness he wasn't ready for. Hef went back to carving the clay, his brow wrinkling while his eyes shimmered with sympathy for his half-brother. He's never gotten over what he lost that day. If we don't play this out carefully, there's a chance he'll kill her himself. She's his flesh and blood. I argued, my claws and fangs extending at the thought of Lucifer harming Ashmiel. He'll know if he sees her. I don't understand how you and Alron didn't sense her presence the same way we feel Lucifer's. That is intriguing, and I have a theory about that, one you don't need to hear just yet. Have sighed but didn't stop his work. And I've known Lucifer far longer than you have. Dahlia betrayed him that night. They both did, at least, that's how he sees it in his mind. You failed to keep them safe, true, but they left him. We have no idea what Dahlia and Ashmiel went through. The scars on Ashmiel's arms were enough to tell me her life hadn't been as happy as I'd first imagined. And to Lucifer, it won't matter, not at first. I have no way to predict how he'll react. He's grown angrier over the years. Impulsive. He's not the same demon he used to be, he said quietly, his words tinged with sadness. Why did you want me to see her then? I snapped. Why have me go there in the first place? Why not simply leave her be to live out her life? Clearly, we're not the only ones interested in her. Do you really want to leave her to deal with whoever's after her on her own? He pinned me with a glower that forced me back a step and I was not going to watch you rot away in that damned cell another second, he bellowed, catching me off guard with his outburst. I'm not only doing this for Lucifer. I'm doing this for you. I swallowed hard, unsure what he was trying to tell me. I don't understand, I whispered. He came to me and rested his hands heavily on my shoulders, giving me a little shake. You have a great destiny. The moment you were chosen to be one of Lucifer's personal guards, I knew it. I sensed the potential for such power, waiting for a chance to show itself. Ashmiel is your future. She always has been. You need her as much as she's going to need you. I wanted to comprehend what was coming out of his mouth. His words were jumbled together with the arguing voices attempting to make a loud comeback in my mind. What destiny? I finally mumbled. You'll see in time. He released me, picked up more clay and went back to the model. Those men who tried to kill her, you believe they were just normal men. They died like them. Hef gave me a solemn nod. 
Perhaps, but I doubt that's what they were. You need to speak with Al Ron before you return to the surface. He'll have more information for you. It's his job to keep track of them, after all. My claws extended, and I growled. You think they're demon hunters? How? Lucifer's own guard couldn't find her after all these years. How would they have tracked her down? That is the question. Speak with Alron, he repeated, his tone dismissive. And don't return to hell until you've told Ashmiel who she is. Without the truth, she'll never be able to defend herself against those who wish her harm. I started to walk away, leaving with far more questions than I hoped to have rattling around in my head, when I paused. Why now? What do you mean, he asks. She's the daughter of Lucifer. She should have been showing signs of being different all her life, but if that was the case, the fallen or another demon would have discovered her sooner. Why is she only now coming into what she is? I guess someone placed a charm on her to keep her hidden, and it's since faded. We won't know until you speak to her and find out where she's been all this time. Now go. I left the forges and set out for Temesis to find Alron. Hef's words unsettled me, a sensation that only grew with every step I took away from him. He seemed to know more about Ashmiel's situation than he let on and his answer about some charm keeping her safe was too easy. As much as he cared about my finding this woman and proving she was Lucifer's daughter, he appeared almost indifferent to learning what had happened to her. But he wanted her back with me. Why? Alron could have easily been the one to tell Ashmiel who she was. Or any other demon could have, for that matter. And never in my nearly three hundred years had someone told me I had a great destiny in store. When had that changed? Does it matter? You heard him. Demon hunters want her. You swore an oath. Or we could simply let her be killed. Why not? She's the reason for our suffering now. She's innocent. She was a child. And no one is ever truly innocent. Let her rot in a cell for decades until she goes mad. Enough. Demons close to me backed away in alarm, whispering to each other at my outburst. Clenching my jaw to stop myself from losing it in front of them, I hurried away. The presence of Ashmiel's aura was quickly dissipating, taking it with it the relief I had from the madness taking over. Hef should have left me in that cell. How was I going to protect anyone? when what little sanity I had left was being eaten away by a soul turning darker by the second. When a small part of me wanted her to pay for what she did to me. Chapter 6 Ashmiel The small flame from the candle flickered each time I moved my hand through it. And each time I passed my hand through it slower and slower, waiting to feel more than heat. I glanced around, but I was alone in the bar. There were no customers in sight, and Hank wasn't coming in until later. It had been three days since the fire destroyed my apartment. The official report was arson. Who did it, the authorities didn't know yet. Strangely enough, that same night, three dead men had been found not too far from my place. The news had been vague regarding the details, but it sounded as if the state of their bodies hadn't been pleasant. The night Hank and I heard that story, we would both looked at each other, especially after they showed photos of the men's faces in hopes of identifying them. I might not have known their names but I knew who they were, the three bastards from the bar. I guess they'd upgraded, from attempting to snag me at the bar, to letting innocent people die for a chance to get close to me. The fourth must not have wanted to get his hands dirty. Or he'd been waiting somewhere for me to run out. Unless they decided they didn't want to kidnap me anymore. Not that I cared. Whatever their intentions had been, no longer mattered. I told Hank about the demon pulling me from my apartment, and wondered if he was the reason those men were dead. That possibility raised more questions aside from the obvious. Since the fire he'd been absent from the bar, which meant I couldn't ask him how he knew I'd been in trouble. And why would he go so far as to murder three humans on my behalf? I was no one. The more you say it doesn't mean it's going to be true my inner voice pointed out. You burned a handprint into the bat. 
You threw those guys around like they weighed nothing. Oh, and yeah, you didn't burn to death. I grunted in reply and glanced at the bat, safely tucked out of sight under the bar. No one had pulled it out as far as I knew, and my secret was safe. That other demon had seen it and probably told some Azrael. He'd shown up here the following evening. That couldn't be a coincidence. Hank's concern had only increased these last few days. He didn't say anything, but there was fear in his eyes. He'd even tried to convince me to take some time off work and simply hang out at his place. Relax. I wasn't about to hide away for the rest of my life just because some assholes decided I was worth kidnapping or killing. He said something about your eyes, the voice reminded me loudly. They were looking for you. Maybe Hank's right. What the hell are you doing? Hank yelled, snatching my wrist and yanking me away from the counter. Are you trying to hurt yourself again? What? I asked confused. You were holding your hand over the damn flame, he scolded, raising my hand and staring at my palm. His bushy brows drew together, then his face went blank. I hadn't realized I'd been holding my hand in the same spot over the candle while my mind rambled on. Hank? There's nothing there, he whispered. You're not burned. Slowly I took my hand back, noting he was right. The fire hadn't burned me, just like the flames at the apartment had somehow left me alone. I tugged the sleeves of my black shirt down and shrugged. It's no big deal. No big deal? Hank rested against the back counter and crossed his arms, but his face remained unreadable. Do you have any idea how lucky you are? You should have been burned alive, as much as I hate to think about it. You should have died but you're alive. The fire didn't even touch you, but you said it was all around you. You felt it. I also could have been hallucinating, I argued. Pretty sure I inhaled a lot of smoke. His face going impossibly more blank, told me he wasn't buying it. Those men appearing in the bar, the other guy attacking you, then the demons appearing and that fire? The timing's too perfect. Don't make this into something it isn't, I pleaded. It's messed up but I'm not anything special. I'm just a human girl who lost her mom at 12 and ran away and was taken in by a kind-hearted guy who owns a bar. That's it. That's the whole story of Ashmiel, so can we please not blow things out of proportion? Denial. 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 Shut up, I inwardly yelled at the voice. Really, I told Hank, I think we should just let it go. I hated how much my voice shook, and how every word he said was precisely what I was thinking. I didn't want to be unique or different. I wanted to work in this bar until Hank got tired of me, or I decided to find a different job. For the first part of my life, I'd constantly been on the move with mom, never knowing why. Then she died, and everything went to shit. For three years, I waited to end up dead. Instead, I'd gotten lucky, and for the last nine years my life had been good. It wasn't perfect, but perfection was overrated. I wanted to go back to before those guys showed up in the bar and pretend like nothing weird had happened. Except you can't. You know those guys are here for a reason, just like the other ones were 12 years ago. Don't be a blind idiot. I ground my teeth, wanting to argue. If Hank caught me yelling at myself, he'd only fret more. I'm not sure what he saw on my face right then, but he pulled me into a bear hug that lifted me off my feet. You're right. I'm overreacting. It's probably nothing. I have to run a few more errands. Hold down the fort. Zane should be coming in about an hour. Not the first time you've left me alone, I reminded him with a grin. Smartass, he mumbled and ducked into the back. A few seconds later, I heard the heavy rear door open and slam shut. Left alone in the bar, I considered testing my hand on the candle more. Having Hank suddenly walk in and find me like that again steered me away from the tiny flame. I kept myself busy stocking the bar and wiping down tables. The door opened while I was in the back, and I yelled I'd be right there. What can I? The rest of the question died in my throat at the sight of Samazrael at the bar. His eye twitched, and he tilted his head like he heard someone talking behind him. His hands were clenched together on the counter, 
the muscles in his tattooed forearms tensed. The wings I'd seen the night he saved me weren't visible, and I frowned, wondering why I wanted to see them again. His hair was even messier than before, hanging loose around his horns. It gave him an almost feral look that was matched by his predatory gaze. The fine lines of his cheekbones were highlighted by his jaw working slowly back and forth while we looked at each other. I waited for him to say something, an explanation maybe for saving me, then disappearing. The seconds turned into a minute, and I hadn't moved an inch. Neither had he. I wasn't even sure I'd blinked since our gazes locked. Just like the night in the bar, nothing else mattered in those long moments except the two of us. The strangest sensation of the air pulsing around me started. Sam Israel's lips parted, and a quiet growl rumbled out his mouth. His eyes glowed, and the hardness in them dissipated to reveal a look of uncertainty and want. Feeling pulled to him as if he held me at the end of a string, I moved forward one slow step at a time. The air became thick, like I'd walk through a wall of water to reach him. He sucked in a sharp breath and his eyes slipped closed. The next breath he took in and let out was shaky. I stopped maybe a foot away from him, studying him closely. How do you do that, he whispered, his voice rough. Do what? I replied quietly. Break through the storm. I had no idea what he was talking about, and frankly didn't care right then. He picked up a lock of my hair from my shoulder and let it glide through his fingers. I pictured him leaning forward and kissing me. Where did that even come from? Sam Israel's eyes narrowed a hint and darted to my lips. Shit. Did he know what I was thinking? That was impossible. Did demons read minds? I was still wrapping my head around what was passing between us, when he tilted his head, his fingers tenderly holding my chin. Heat radiated from his body or mine. I wasn't sure at this point. This had to be a dream. That's what I told myself even when Samazrael lowered his head. His lips brushed softly against mine. My face grew hot while those sea-green eyes never broke contact. I started to raise my arms, wanting to be as close to him as possible, when the ice machine kicked on behind me. The loud noise shattered the moment. Samazrael backed away, his eyes shifting from green to black and back again. His lips parted, showing me his fangs extending before he closed his mouth. A warning growl echoed from him when I made to follow. Are you all right? I asked my voice barely more than a breath. Give me a moment, he uttered, holding out his hand to keep me back. He rested heavily on the counter, as if it was the only thing keeping him upright. Yeah, sure. Not like you're the one who just kissed me, but yeah, take all the time you need. His eyes flared. I'm sorry. I don't know what came over me then you didn't want to kiss me. I took another step toward him, and he backed away further. His claws dug into the counter, leaving rivulets behind when he yanked his hands away. Worried he was going to have a fit of some kind, I made a note of where the cordless phone was. I had no idea what the paramedics could do for a demon, but I wasn't about to let him keel over on the floor in Hank's bar. Samazrael breathed in and out deeply three times, his nostrils flaring and that tick in his jaw going a mile a minute. Do you have any idea what you're doing? What are you talking about? I didn't do anything. You are in fact, he argued through gritted teeth. You're doing it right now. I'm standing here talking to you. That's it. His throaty laugh pulled me to him until he threw his hand back out and the laughter turned into a grunt. Stop. Just stay there. The power emanating from you is stronger than I originally sensed. Power? I repeated. Yes, power. Look, I don't know what's wrong with you or why you decided to come to this bar and watch me or stalk me and then save me and kiss me but I'm done, I ranted. Why are you here? And you don't kiss someone and then try to take it back. I never said I wanted to take it back, he corrected softly, his eyes darting to my mouth. I shook my head, sending my hair flying. Fine, you wanted to kiss me, but can we talk about the other thing you said? Why did you say I have power? I'm a human and not a special one, I can assure you of that. You're really getting this denial thing down, my inner voice mused, and I pursed my lips. 
That's not entirely true, Samazrael said, and the voice inside my head let out a quiet cheer. I planted my hands on my hips, unsure what I was more aggravated at. The fact that he'd kiss me and stopped so quickly, or that this was not the direction I hoped a conversation with Samazrael would take. Is there something wrong with you? I blurted. He straightened, his sea-green irises darkening by the second. Yes. You. I'm sorry what? You are what's wrong with me, he snapped and stomped to me. Seriously? You don't get to come in here and start mouthing off to me after you kiss me, I shot back. I really need to let the whole kissing thing go. There were bigger issues here. I knew that but damn his lips had been so warm. I licked mine, already picturing him kissing me again. He cursed, and I spotted him eyeing my mouth while his cheeks flushed. This time I was the one who put some space between us. I didn't ask you to walk into Hank's bar, and I sure as hell didn't ask you to save me. Course you didn't. Your father did that. In my head, I repeated his words. I had to have heard him wrong. I didn't even know who my dad was. Why would some demon I'd never met before know him? Any warm fuzzy feelings I started to feel for him fizzled out. You're lying. Whatever game this is, I'm not playing. Thanks for saving me. Now get out. I can't do that. Yeah, actually you can. The door's right there. I suggest you walk out it now before the bouncer shows up. His lips curled into a sneer. You're threatening me with a human? I held his glare with one of my own. Or I can just beat you over the head with a bat. How does that sound? Your mother was the fallen angel Dahlia, he stated, and your father is Lucifer, king of hell. I'm the demon who swore an oath the day you were born to be by your side and protect you from the perils of this world. I'm your personal guard. Well, I was. This had to be a joke. He wasn't smiling or laughing, and the serious glint in his eyes said he believed every word that just came out of his mouth. My mom wasn't a fallen angel, I whispered. And my dad was some deadbeat asshole who didn't give two shits about her or me. Take your lies and get out of this bar right now. The same surge of heat I felt the night that man attacked me sparked to life in my gut. Violently, it roiled around until I thought I was going to be sick. My hands shook. I grabbed the edge of the counter to steady them. All that seemed to do was make the rest of me tremble. The anger that had been a part of my life was getting worse. A sliver of fear that I was going to somehow lose control of it whispered through my mind. Get out, I repeated sharply. You have his eyes, he said, and I froze. There are no other eyes on this earth like his except yours. But you look like Dahlia. Stop, I yelled abruptly. Just stop. You don't know me, and you don't get to act like you do. But I do know you, he argued, following me as I marched away, intending to lock myself in the back room until he left. What had I been thinking? I spent all this time daydreaming about the handsome demon, and all those dreams broke right in front of me. Samazrael grabbed my shoulder, whipping me around to face him. You are Lucifer's daughter. Your rightful place is with him in hell and that's where I'm taking you. Get off me, I shouted, tearing away from him. You have no idea what you're talking about. I swore an oath, he repeated with a growl that shook me, competing with the fiery anger churning inside my body. An oath to watch over you and keep you safe. I will not break it now because you're too stubborn to see the truth. The truth? I barked a laugh, shoving him. I wasn't sure who was more surprised when he staggered back a step, him or me, but I didn't let up. The truth is my life was shit, and you have the nerve to come in here and say you're my bodyguard sent by Lucifer himself to watch over me and keep me safe? If that's true then where the fuck were you ha? Huh? Where? I raved, shoving him again and again, my body growing feverish with every word that left my mouth. You were lost to us he replied, catching my hands and holding them tight when I attempted to break free. When you were a baby, Dahlia's home was attacked. I tried to stop them, but I was overwhelmed. When I came to, you and she were gone. We searched, he went on even as I gaped at him in disbelief. Lucifer sent demons everywhere to hunt you down, 
but no one could find either of you. You were just gone, and then one night, a demon sees a woman with silver eyes exactly like Lucifer's. I heard about the fight here, heard what you did. So what? I tugged on my hands again, but he didn't let go. Adrenaline. Yeah? Did adrenaline stop you from being burned, too? I had no answer for him. None of what he'd said could be true. How could I believe it? My mother, a fallen angel. If she had been, then why had our lives been so miserable? Why did we move around so much? If I were the daughter of Lucifer, the first and most powerful demon on the planet, how come he hadn't been able to find me? It makes a bit of sense though, don't you think? What the hell are you talking about? My inner voice sighed. If mom was what he says, those men coming to the house, killing her and trying to take you, doesn't seem so weird anymore, does it? Not if they knew who you are. Those words were like weights that fell on my shoulders. With them came the darkness that had been my life for so long, threatening to crush me. I didn't want to, but my mind dragged me through the highlights reel of all the shit I suffered in my short life. All of that could have been prevented if Lucifer had, what, cared about me more. Or if Samazrael hadn't failed. He was the reason my life had been a nightmare. The worst parts of the last twenty years started to resurface in my mind. Before those images fully manifested, I yelled, pushing some Azrael. He sailed across the bar, taking down tables and chairs in his wake. Panting, and with every inch of me on fire, I threw myself after him like I was possessed. Sparks crackled at my fingertips, something that should have made me panic, but I didn't slow. By the time I reached some Azrael, my hands were coated in a fire, and I had no idea how it happened. I grabbed a chair and broke it over his shoulder while he climbed to his feet. I was a burning pillar of rage, needing a release. I grabbed another chair, ready to smash it over his head, when his hand was suddenly wrapped around my throat. He spun me around and pinned me to the wall. His claws extended and aimed for my face. His face had morphed into a brutish guise of a beast, his fangs extending and more than ready to rip my throat out. I expected his wings to burst free at any second. A voice in the back of my mind said I should be terrified, but there was no fear, not a hint of it. Overwhelmed with frantic energy, I clawed at his arm, drawing blood, while the fire continued to grow and stretch up my arms. Nothing I did seemed to hurt him. He roared the sound deafening, but I screamed right back, sending a shockwave through the bar knocking the rest of the tables to the floor. The storm of the chaos fighting to get free forced a second shriek from me, the flames winding up my arms to my shoulders. Samazrael flinched in the face of it. The last note died and he blanched, releasing me and stumbling back. His face returned to normal, while I debated attacking him again. Ashmiel? he whispered, the black slipping from his eyes to reveal the lively color of his irises. The fires dissipated and vanished, along with the madness that had taken me over. A rush of dizziness struck me. The next thing I knew, I was on the floor, with Samizrael's arm holding me upright. He rested me against the wall. His lip lifted, and he growled before letting me go and storming out the front door. I managed not to fall over and stared after him. The last couple of minutes replayed over and over in my mind, with me sitting there, dumbstruck on the floor. What did I do? That hadn't been me. It couldn't have been. I gasped, and clapped a hand over my mouth to stop myself from losing it. Trembling, I took in the destruction I caused in the bar. What was happening to me? You need to get off the floor, my inner voice said sternly. Get your ass off the floor and clean this place up. Do you want Hank seeing this mess? God, that was the last thing I wanted. He was worried about me enough as it was. If I told him some Azrael came back and we got in a fight, he'd lose his mind. Unsure where the strength came from and using the wall, I stood up. I picked up the chairs and tables that had been knocked over, riding them until the place was put together. I just finished tossing the broken chairs in the dumpster out back, when Zane's Mustang pulled into the lot. I waved, forcing a smile on my face, then ducked inside. Keep it together. Just don't fall apart. You're okay. Nothing some Azrael said can be real. You are not the daughter of Lucifer. I told myself. 
You want a shot of whiskey to go with that denial? Shut up, I murmured to that voice I hated more every damn day. Slowly, I held up my hands, hands that had just controlled fire not too long ago. Shit, I whispered. The bell above the bar door chimed and I jumped. I let my hands fall, and putting on a grin, I went to work. Nothing some Azrael said was true. That's all there was to it. I might be losing my mind, but I was not Lucifer's daughter. Chapter 7 Some Azrael I staggered down the sidewalk, growling to try and tune out the voices clamoring to be heard over each other. What was that back at the bar? I'd been surrounded by her aura, let myself get lost in its comforting embrace. And her thoughts, her emotions, there'd been no wall up today. Nothing to prevent what she was feeling from swarming around me and through me. I kissed her. Her own want became tangled with my need to drown out my soul's agony and feel anything until I didn't know what I was doing. Then my lips were on hers. What had I been thinking? She was Lucifer's daughter. Then why do you want to do it again? The notion stopped me short. Did I? I assumed most of what drove me to run my fingers through her hair and gently touch her skin that was far warmer than an average human's had been because of what she'd felt. I held up my hand, rubbing my fingers together. Her aura coated my skin. Was that why I touched her or was it something more? Hef's words about having a theory regarding my reaction to Ashmiel came back to me. What did he know that I didn't? Not that it mattered. I couldn't want her. I couldn't want anyone not like that. Not when I was a walking threat with fangs and claws. I meant to take my time telling her the truth too. I wanted to know where she'd been since she was stolen from me. But when the explosion of tangled emotions coming from her went from wanting to confusion and right to anger, the words poured out of me. Why was I surprised she hadn't believed me? And I just had to push her. I hadn't meant to, and then Ashmiel lost it and went after me. Shit. I could have hurt her, but the power inside her, how did she not know she'd had it all this time? But she does know, I whispered, remembering how she reacted. She hadn't been shocked or terrified of the fire, creeping up her arms. The night of the fire, she'd appeared stunned to learn she hadn't been burned, but there'd been resolve in her eyes too. Some part of her, however small, knew she wasn't normal. Except if she'd been using this power all along, someone would have seen her much sooner. Hef had to be right. Whoever stole her away must have placed a powerful enchantment on her demon half to keep her hidden. Either that person had grown careless or they were dead. Every day that passed, her power grew in strength. If I didn't get her to hell soon, have someone show her how to control the hellfire coursing through her veins, she'd hurt someone. The question surrounding Ashmiel just continued to pile up. Where had she been all this time? How did she end up so covered in scars? Each question drove another spike of aggravation through my skull and added to how unstable I already was. Dealing with Ashmiel's unrestrained emotions on top of mine was going to be a nightmare. The only other time I experienced a moment that intense was with Lucifer. Her anger was a dead ringer for his. She was his blood. There was no denying it. I had to go back and convince her of the truth, but how? Half the voices inside my head wanted to keep my oath. The other half continued to scream that we should kill her. Lucifer already thought she was dead. Where was the harm in making that a reality? I abruptly turned down a nearby alley, needing to put distance between myself and the sinners of this city. I couldn't be Ashmiel's guard. The stark reality that the voices would eventually lead me to break my oath was a punch to the gut. One moment of weakness was all it would take. I'd go back, talk to her, and convince her to come with me to hell. Once she met Lucifer and accepted the truth, he could find another demon more suited to protect her. The thought barely crossed my mind, and my fangs extended, piercing my bottom lip. I didn't want to, but I pictured another demon watching over Ashmiel, who wasn't me. Pictured him getting close to her, feeling her emotions as I just had. Kissing her. Whirling around, 
I buried my fist in the brick wall of the building to my right. The pain in my hand grounded me, and I punched the wall a second time, and a third, not caring how bloody and busted my hand became. If you go back there, you'll mess up again. It's true. You're too weak to keep her safe. Look at what you did. She was nearly crushed to death in that fire. And back there? You could have easily ripped her throat out. And what about you, huh? We all know what you really want. You want her dead. Shouting, I dug my claws into the bricks. Drained as if something sucked away my life force, I sagged against the wall. The voices ramped up their vicious mental attacks. I struggled to cling onto the last remnants of Ashmiel's aura on my skin, recalled the brief kiss we shared. The touch of her lips on mine returned, how soft and warm they'd been. It worked to keep the madness at bay for a few moments. Then the dam broke, and I was swallowed by the crushing weight of what I endured in hell. Dizzy and numb, I staggered further down the alley. The voices tugged me one way than another, and I stumbled without direction through Turquoise Falls. A few people tried to stop me and ask if I was all right. A savage snarl sent them running away. The sun had been setting when I stormed out of Hank's hideaway. Night fell at some point, not that it was ever really dark in this desert oasis. Bright lights from casinos, strip clubs, and bars lit up the night and wrecked the peace that usually came once the sun went down. Shouting and laughter pierced my ears, fighting against the tumultuous turmoil already inside my skull. A while later, I wandered down another alley. I wasn't sure how long I'd been walking around. I should have gone back to hell and found Hef, told him I couldn't do this. Somehow, I never made it there. A mad laugh escaped my lips while I hunched over, using the building for support. Maybe that was the joke. I'd never left my cell at all, and this was a new form of torture. Shit, what if Lucifer never freed me at all? This was merely part of my punishment, a way to break me even further. That was the only explanation that made sense. Ashmiel wasn't really alive. How could she be? There'd been so much blood that night, so much of it. No one could have survived whatever wounds caused that crimson to cover every surface of the room. Ashmiel was dead, and I remained trapped in hell. You lost your way, friend, a voice called from behind me. Wiping tears of mirth from my eyes, I lifted my head. At the end of the alley, two men stood shoulder to shoulder. Piss off, I said through my dark laughter, if you know what's good for you. Neither left. They glanced over their shoulders, as if looking for someone. With a shrug at each other, they came closer. I pushed off the wall, straightening to my full height. They hesitated for a second, then kept coming. Demons. They had to be demons, coming to give me another beating. Any second now, the alley would disappear, and I'd end up back in my cell. This wasn't real. The scent of their sins permeated the air and made my nose burn. That stench alone told me they were humans and had already lived sin-filled lives. No, they hadn't just sinned. They'd committed unspeakable crimes against others of their kind. Murders. Horrendous murders. My laughter cut off, and I backed up a step. If this was merely an illusion, and these were demons appearing as humans, I shouldn't be able to sense their sins. The voices that had spent the last few hours taunting me faded away, leaving a deafening silence behind. The two men spread out, trying to come around both sides. The alley was tight and not ideal for hand-to-hand. -hand. The one to my right whistled a cheerful tune, grinning at me with a wink. I grunted, ready to tell him off, when a rustling came from my left. A fist collided with my face. My head jerked to the right, and a second threw me into the wall. He wasn't merely human. He was using something to enhance his strength. He had to be. No human was this strong. Supernatural ability had to be part of his makeup. How hadn't I smelled it on him? Rage engulfed my senses. I bared my fangs, my face morphing into the monster that lurked beneath the surface. Claws extended. I glared at the man who thought it was a good idea to attack a demon. I have nothing for you, I informed them. Leave now and you can keep your souls. The men jeered. You don't scare us, demon, 
the one who struck me said, You're the one who won't be leaving this alley alive. He reached under his black jacket and revealed a long dagger, its blade glistening in the streetlights. His companion removed a similar weapon from his back. I didn't need this shit tonight. Ready to tell them off again, I opened my mouth. They came at me. I barely brought my arm up in time to stop being slashed in the face. Three moves later, I grunted at the burning pain on my shoulder. Blood seeped from the fresh wound. The man raised his dagger, coated in my blood. He sneered. I stretched my jaw wide open, bellowing. A sliver of apprehension appeared in the depths of his eyes. This time, I lunged first, moving to relieve them of their weapons. I pushed them into the defensive, but it didn't last long. They tag-teamed me, and soon I was covered in numerous shallow cuts. They stung, but none of the injuries were a threat to my life. See how weak you are. How pathetic. Shouting for the voice to shut up, I charged forward once again. I shoved the men back with a bellow, slamming my open hands into their chests. The way they attacked and the daggers they used were familiar. They moved exactly as the others had all those years ago, when Ashmiel was taken. Back then, I hadn't sensed anything supernatural about those men either, and yet they'd overpowered me. There was a discipline to their movement that took years to master, and the power behind their hits was fueled by more than mere muscle. One of them raised his hand, wiping sweat from his brow, and his sleeve slipped down his arm. The brand designating these men as demon hunters was enough to tell me, I couldn't let these men leave this alley alive. It was what occurred in the space of those few seconds after I saw the brand that sent me into a blind rage. Eric, you guys take care of the demon yet, a voice crackled through a radio at one of the man's belts. The man I assumed was Eric didn't move to grab the radio but said, getting there. The guy beside him snickered. The radio crackled again, then. Eric. Damn it, man, we don't have all night. The bar's closing. It's just going to be two guys and her. Don't mess this up. My heart thundered in my chest, and I breathed out heavily through my nose, a fire churning in my stomach. Ashmiel. They were talking about Ashmiel. Demon hunters were trying to kidnap her. I'd failed her once. I wasn't going to let these bastards steal her away from me. Red flooded my vision and fire coated my hands. I threw myself at the men like a wild beast finally let out of its cage. Their curses turned to screams of pain while I tore at them, ripping them apart with my claws and fangs, burning them alive as I went. Blood spurted from their wounds and their daggers clattered to the ground. Eventually their shouting stopped and the alley fell silent. Car horns honking and happy chatter from people out on the main drag filtered down the narrow alley to me, so bright and cheery clashing against the carnage at my feet. Blood dripped from my claws, splattering on the concrete. I spat a chunk of flesh, smirking while I chuckled madly. The hellfire that had curled around my hands slowly went out. I hadn't felt my inner fire in over two decades. I'd missed it, but when I attempted to summon it again, nothing happened. Time. It would take time to return to my full strength. And apparently, knowing Ashmiel's life was in danger sent me into a blood rage. Not so weak now, am I? I snapped to the voices inside my head, fighting back another burst of mad laughter at what remained of the men at my feet. We'll see, they replied together, and fell eerily silent. The crackling of a radio came from the corpses. I tossed aside a few limbs and dug around until I found the small black device. I couldn't make out anything the voice said, but I knew where they were. Crushing the radio in my hand, I turned to the entrance of the alley. If I stepped out onto the street like this, I'd cause a panic. I turned to the brick wall, ready to climb it to reach the rooftops, when a gasp made me pause. Worried another human stumbled upon the scene, I whirled around to deal with them. Two shimmering forms rose from the ground, their faces twisted into over-exaggerated shocked expressions. The men's souls. They hadn't taken their trip to hell yet and remained hovering over their mutilated bodies. Finish them off, one of the voices urged. You feel their sins. Is eternity in hell really a punishment? 
They deserve nothing but oblivion. Give them that. Do it. Do it. Do it. Shouting at the clamoring voices once again, I stormed toward the souls. They panicked, but there was nowhere for them to go. I grabbed hold of them, able to touch their ethereal form since I was a demon, and brought them closer. My jaw dropped and I breathed them in. Their bodies collapsed into two streams of glowing white mist and entered my mouth. Euphoria poured over me, drowning out the screams of the damned souls I absorbed into myself. One soul would have been more than enough to win a fight against a few demon hunters. Two fueled my strength and left me wanting to spill blood just to watch it stain the ground. I shuddered, adjusting to the boost of vitality the souls gave me. When the trembling ceased, I turned back to the wall and punched my claws into the bricks. Quickly, I hauled myself to the rooftop, spread my wings and shot up into the sky. Chapter 8 Ashmiel The last customer left the bar, and Zane said he was locking up. I picked up a bin of dirty dishes, carrying them to the kitchen. All night long, my mind had been on Samazrael and if I would see him again after we'd attacked each other like, well, like demons. Then there was the bombshell he'd dropped. Hank had asked me at least fifty times what was bugging me tonight. How was I supposed to tell him that apparently, Samazrael thought I was Lucifer's long-lost daughter? That wasn't exactly an easy conversation to have. Not that I believed Samazrael anyway. Cursing I tossed the bin of dishes in the sink, grimacing when a couple of glasses cracked and broke. Leaning heavily on the metal sink, I glared at the shards of glass. The anger I experienced today had been a hundred times worse than what I was used to. And the fire that had curled up my arms? How did I do that? You know how. The faster you admit it, the quicker you can deal with this mess. You just need to shut up. Why? I'm right and you know it. You've always been different. Say it with me. Not this different. I turned on the faucet after I removed the broken glasses and filled the sink with water. The notion that I was somehow hallucinating made more sense than accepting anything Samazrael had told me. Lucifer's daughter. Whatevs. I was better off believing my dad was a deadbeat drug dealer. Then again, I suppose the king of hell fit the bill. Mom ran away from him and took me with her for a reason. She might have loved him, but she'd been scared enough to leave. Scared of him? Did he hurt her? The idea of my dad laying a hand on mom sent a surge of heat roiling through me. My hands curled around the metal sink. The groan of metal met my ears and I frowned. Shit. Two dents that fit my hands perfectly were now part of the sink. You've always felt a part of you was missing, my inner voice murmured. I turned off the faucet, catching my reflection on the surface of the water. So what? Maybe that part is the demonic half of you. I was sure the lips of my reflection moved, but I blamed it on the still rippling water. I'm not part demon. And if you're wrong, this time her lips did move. I jerked away from the sink. Madly, I paced from one end of the small kitchen to the other. Too bad I couldn't blame it on booze. I hadn't had a single drink tonight, not trusting myself to be even slightly inebriated in case Samazrael came back and we fought again. Control. I had to stay in control. I wasn't sure why that was so important, but the mantra replayed itself over and over in my head until I was whispering it aloud. Needing to get the dishes clean so I could get out of there, I tentatively walked back to the sink. Slapping a hand over my mouth to muffle my startled yelp, I stumbled back into the kitchen island, shaking my head. My reflection had been in the water, scowling up at me. Her eyes had been filled with fire, and there were fangs in her open mouth. Stop denying the truth. This is who you are. Embrace it so we can be free. I winced at the intensity of those words and the scorching flash that followed. Sweat broke out on my forehead and dotted my upper lip. My hands burned as if I'd shoved them in hot coals. It didn't hurt but the smoke rising off my skin was enough to make my stomach clench. I had to get out of here before Hank or Zane saw me like this. Being anywhere but here 
was better than staying and dragging Hank into whatever mess I'd landed myself in. I was halfway to the back door, ready to issue an apology to Hank, when a shout came from the bar. Hank's grunt of pain followed, and I bolted out of the kitchen, skidding to a stop on the tile floor a second later. There she is, the man I'd thrown across the bar the other night announced. He wasn't alone. Five others were spread out around him. Zane was on the floor, his chest rising and falling, the only indication he was alive. Blood pooled out around him. He didn't have much time. Get out of here, Hank grated. I spotted Hank after the man in the lead stepped aside, revealing one of his goons was holding a knife to Hank's throat. Who are you? I yelled, ignoring Hank's order to leave. I wasn't going to abandon him here to die. Neither him nor Zane. They were family. I shouted my question to the man a second time, wanting to smack that smirk off his face. Fight or flight was kicking in. My lip twitched, while my inner voice whispered that these men were about to pay for what they did. I sure as hell wasn't running. Not tonight. Oh no. Tonight we were fighting. Just like that afternoon, a wave of fire pulsed inside me, spreading to my limbs. The temperature in the bar rose, and I was no longer simply Ashmiel. I was wrath. I was destruction. My lips curled into a wicked grin, and my inner voice cackled madly. Xavier, the man replied casually, obviously not sensing the danger he was in. And you are Ashmiel, the daughter of Lucifer. Says who? I ax. Xavier scratched at his cheek, shrugging. Several sources. We've been searching for you for a long time, he replied. Never thought to look in a place like this. You probably would have ended up somewhere better if your mom hadn't been killed. Something between a growl and a grunt escaped my mouth. The noise startled me, but Xavier grinned wider. You know nothing about my mom or me. Let Hank go and get out. Or what? You're a bit outnumbered. He snapped his fingers, and the heavy door to the rear entrance slammed open. Glancing over my shoulder, I saw five more men crowd into the bar, cutting off my retreat. Great, I inwardly muttered. This plan is going swimmingly. What are we supposed to do now? Trust your instincts. Rolling my eyes at how unhelpful that advice was, I debated my chances of making it out of here alive. If I could keep Xavier talking, then maybe we'd get lucky, and someone passing by would, shit would what? The windows were too dark to see in. I could start screaming, but the guys anxiously shifting behind me was a terrible sign. If I started shouting for help, the goons would come after me. This was bad no worse than bad. Hank and Zane were going to end up dead, and it'd be my fault. Just like Mom's death had been all my fault. Her broken and bloody body appeared in my mind's eye. I hadn't been able to help her when those men broke into our home. She'd yelled at me to run even when the intruders tried to grab me. I wanted to stay, but Mom had shoved me out my bedroom window and told me to run and hide, that she'd come and find me. Only she never had. I'd sprinted into the woods around our small cabin home and run until my feet bled, and I couldn't hear the angry men's shouts anymore. I'd stayed in the shadows of the forest until the following morning. When I'd reached our home I found it trashed and mom dead. They'd killed her but they'd been after me. I flinched at the memory and the realization that the feeling was familiar. These men, they had to be the same ones who came after me all those years ago, the same ones who murdered my mom. They'd taken everything from me and now they were back to finish the job. All this was happening because of me. No, because of Lucifer. The bar spun around me, and I swayed, using the bar to hold myself up. I was hot and cold at the same time, and trembling all over. My lip twitched, and my gums ached like something was trying to burst through them. When my fingertips throbbed, I barely glanced at them, not understanding what was going on with me and not really caring. Xavier was talking again, but his words were muffled against the rushing sounds filling my ears. Someone wanted to find me back then. And Xavier and these men, they wanted me now. Who were they? Does it matter? Are you going to let them take you? I shook my head so fast a headache bloomed behind my eyes. 
Xavier sighed, and my head snapped in his direction. That's the best deal I can offer you, he said, not that I knew what he was even talking about. Deal? His brow rose. Not very bright, are you? Listen to me carefully, he said, exaggerating every word. I'll let the old man here live and you come with us. No fighting. No killing anyone. I won't even have them bind your hands with the manacles, if you agree to come willingly. Deep down you know the truth. You've known all along. Samazrael was just that last push. Listen to yourself. Listen to what your body's telling you. What your soul's saying, the voice inside me urged. Well? Do we have a deal or not? Xavier snapped, resting his hands on his hips while he glared. And if I say no? I heard myself ax. Things get messy. You don't want that to happen, do you? I didn't. Seeing Hank's throat slit would haunt me forever. But I wasn't a twelve-year-old little girl anymore. I wasn't helpless. The coiling fire inside me told me as much. When I'd attacked some Azrael, I hadn't been thinking. I'd simply acted. My fingers twitched and sparks crackled around them. Xavier's smile was replaced with a sneer. You'll regret this. I opened my mouth to reply when a presence brushed against my mind. It was fast approaching and I grinned. I wasn't alone after all. Some Azrael, I breathed. What? Xavier shouted. The question was barely out of his mouth when the front windows shattered and a burst of hot gusts stormed through the bar. Sam Israel's roar tore through the room. The men near the door scattered and yelled. Hank was thrown to the side. I managed to notice him crawling out of the way when the men behind me shouted and rushed forward. I threw my hands upward, amazed at the black claws now jutting from the end of my fingertips, and threw myself at my attackers. The first one who laid a hand on me cursed and yanked the appendage back. His palm and fingers were covered in burns and his skin smoked. When it caught fire, a dark laugh escaped me. The four others hesitated, backing away while their friend writhed on the floor, still burning. What are you doing? Xavier shouted. Grab her. Not sure what made me do it, I waved the men forward. With their companion now still on the floor burned to a crisp, they glared at me. One by one they removed long daggers from behind them, the blades glinting in the neon lights. I had a second to realize how screwed I was, when they charged forward a second time. The sparks at my fingertips turned into living flames. Another guttural growl forced its way out of me, and I ducked and dodged the sharp daggers. My body moved, without my telling it what to do. Each time a blade nearly stabbed toward me, I found myself spinning away from it. I snagged another of the attackers, smashing my hands to his face. He shrieked, unable to break free from the flames coiling around his head and neck. I lunged for another one, ready to cause him the same agonizing death when a burning pain dragged down my back and I gasped. Ashmiel. Sam Israel's snarl reverberated around the bar, and a body sailed over my head, crashing into the far wall. A quick look around showed more men had shown up. Three were dead near the front door, but even as Sam Azrael took down another two, moving too fast for me to even follow, three more took their place. A stabbing pain to my side nearly sent me to my knees. I swung my arm around, catching the attacker in the neck and sending him flying over the bar. With the dagger still protruding from my side, I staggered around. Not from the wound. Sure it hurt like a bitch, but the fire burning inside me had quickly turned into an inferno. We have to get you out of here, Hank's voice said from nearby. He reached for me. I pulled away and shrieked in panic. No. Don't touch me, I warned. Don't. I'll hurt you. You'd never hurt me, girly. Let's go, come on. I shook my head, fighting to stay in control even while my heart raced impossibly faster. That internal fire threatened to consume me. I gnashed my teeth together, rage replacing every other emotion until that's all I was, a storm of raw fury. It pulsed within me, seeking a way out. I yelled for Hank to leave, but he stayed right by my side. Xavier was still bellowing orders over the chaos of the fight. The few men who tried to come near me halted, running into each other in their haste to back away. 
Samazrael appeared in front of me, grabbing my shoulders. He too told Hank to get Zane out of there. The old man was too damn stubborn to listen. Get control, Samazrael ordered, his claws causing little pinpricks of pain where they dug into my shoulders. He gave me a little shake, and my gaze locked onto his black eyes. The darkness that had seemed so empty swirled with strange, glowing gold flecks. They hadn't been like that before, had they? And his hands were quivering. What was wrong with him? Can you hear me? You have to stop this. Control it. I opened my mouth to ask how, but all that came out was a scream. The fire writhed and twisted inside me, ripping through my abdomen. Samazrael shouted at Hank again. I wanted to tell Samazrael to leave too, but words were impossible to form. Arms wrapped tightly around me, and my face was smashed into a hard chest. Something else closed around me, blocking out the light. Belatedly, I realized they were leathery wings. Samazrael's wings. He'd cocooned me against his body. What was he thinking? I was going to lose it. He needed to get out of there. Why was he doing this? Why? Panic set in, and I fought to get away from him, to tell him to run. Not leaving your side, he uttered. Not again. My claws curled into his body, tearing through the thin fabric of his shirt and slicing into his skin. If it hurt, he didn't let me know, and his arms and wings remained firmly around me. I didn't want to hurt him or anyone else, but whatever control I had over the fire burned up. The heat was unbearable, and like an old comfort at the same time. I opened my eyes, but all I saw was bright red and orange flames. They were me, and I was them. I screamed, the heat exploding outward from my center. Then there was only fire, and nothing at all. Chapter 9 Samazrael Debris continued to fall around me. I tucked my head, waiting for the dust to settle. When the building groaned, I chanced to look. The bar became nothing but charred remains after Ashmiel lost control of her power. Hellfire wasn't merely fire. It was alive, and unless the one who wielded it was a master at working with it, it destroyed everything in its path. I'd hoped by wrapping her in my wings, I could contain the damage. Too bad I hadn't. Carefully, I unfurled my wings, shaking them of ash and burnt timbers that had fallen in from the ceiling. Ashmiel was passed out against my chest, her face slack and her body limp. She was feverish, even for a demon. Her claws had scored rivulets into my chest. Grimacing, I pried them out of my skin. I needed to wake her, and was about to tap her cheeks when I took in the full extent of the damage she'd caused. Skeletal remains were scattered about the bar. Anyone who didn't get out when they had the chance was dead. A body nearby bore a tiny bit of a black leather biker vest burned onto its ribs. That man, Hank, I'd yelled at him to leave. Why didn't he listen? Now he was dead. They were all dead, and Ashmiel was the one who killed them. Maneuvering Ashmiel around in my arms, I made it to my knees. My head began to spin, and I set her down quickly. Throwing my head to the side, I vomited, spitting bile from my mouth after the heaving stopped. I broke out in a cold sweat and shivers. Another round of heaving had me cursing for giving in to the voices. Wiping spittle from my mouth, I glowered at the floor, waiting for the chorus of voices to start. They never did. Through the waves of nausea left over from swallowing souls, I sensed Ashmiel's aura surrounding me. Her emotions were blocked off, but the presence she gave off wouldn't dissipate with her unconscious. I focused on her pulsing aura seeking me out as if to comfort me even now. I hauled her into my arms. Bracing myself, I pushed to my feet, biting back curses when I nearly toppled back over. Sirens approached and panicked yells reached my ears. Holding Ashmiel against my chest with one arm, I turned my back to the front door. I was worried I wouldn't have enough strength to create a portal, and still I waved my hand. Thankfully one appeared and I stepped through it. I made it three steps, then my knees buckled. So Mazrael. Have called alarmed. I'd created a portal right outside his forge. Anywhere else would have caused a commotion I wasn't ready to deal with. 
Ashmiel's head lolled on her shoulders, and she winced. I glanced down her body, noting the blood that had stained her ripped shirt. What happened? With Hef's help, I made it to my feet and followed him away from the forge's heat and toward his living quarters. Thankfully, there were no other demons around, and we weren't disturbed. Demon hunters, I growled, carefully laying Ashmiel down on the leather lounge in Hef's sitting room. They attacked the bar, came after her. I gripped the edge of the cushions, telling myself to get it together, but my stomach churned. I rushed to the kitchen and barely made it to the sink before I was sick. My teeth chattered, and I shook so violently it ached. What did you do? Hef demanded, appearing at my side. So, Mazrael, look at me. Slowly, I turned to face him. His lips thinned, and he roughly grabbed my chin, studying my eyes. How many, he asked. Two, I rasped. They cornered me in an alley. They meant to kill me, so I couldn't protect Ashmiel. My stomach twisted in knots, but I managed not to start heaving again. I tore them apart, and as for their souls, they didn't deserve to exist, not after what they'd done in life. Been a long time since you've absorbed one. Coming down is going to be horrible. I can deal with it. His arch brow said we'd see. He let me go and I followed him back through the kitchen to the sitting room. Ashmiel hadn't stirred yet. With my head a bit clearer, I noted the various slashes covering her arms and stomach. There was one stab wound to her side. Hef went to push her shirt up to see it better, and I snarled, lunging forward to stop him. He backed away, tilting his head while he watched me take up a protective stance beside Ashmiel. Interesting, he mused. I stopped growling and closed my mouth around my fangs. What was that about? Hef wasn't a threat to her. Sorry. No, it's understandable. You're her protector. His lips twitched like he was about to smile. Whatever he was thinking, he kept to himself. I was Ashmiel's protector, but this was about more than my oath. Her aura was pulsing steadily out from her body and pressing into mine. If Hef touched her, he might end up pulling it away from me. I didn't want to share this comfort with anyone. If it left me even slightly, the voices would return, I knew they would. The longer I studied Hef, the more I noticed he wasn't acting differently at all. Ashmiel's presence was as strong as Lucifer's, if not more so. And yet, he appeared unaffected by it. How do you not feel her like I do? I whispered, confused. I sense her as I've told you, Hef replied. You, however, seem to have a much deeper connection to her. I've seen it before. You have. When? With whom? Those are good questions. Ones you might get answers to later. He nodded to Ashmiel. You need to check her wounds, make sure they're healing. And tell me everything about this fight. I sat on the floor beside the lounge and began to tell Hef about what we'd been through. While relaying the incident surrounding the fight at the bar, I never left Ashmiel's side. Her lesser wounds had closed relatively quickly. The puncture at her side was nearly done now. I'd even checked her legs, not surprised to find no bruising left behind from the beam that had pinned her during the fire. It wasn't her physical wounds I was worried about. What she did back at the bar, the amount of power she'd manifested, and the lives she took, that wasn't going to be an easy event to simply put behind her and move on. She hadn't only killed the demon hunters. She'd killed innocent humans. Hef hadn't spoken a word the entire time I talked. He paced from one end of the room to the other, holding his chin. Every now and then, he let out a growl and shook his head. That had been going on for the last twenty minutes, and I couldn't take his silence any longer. Well? I snapped. Hef didn't stop his pacing, but his eyes narrowed. How did the demon hunters find her before we did? Been asking myself that same question since the fire. And what she did, he went on, as if I hadn't said anything, that amount of power, she's going to be a danger to herself and everyone around her until you teach her to control it. Me. I sputtered. I can't teach her. I'm barely keeping myself together. 
I can scarcely use my hellfire to even show her. It came to me once and now nothing. You need to remember who and what you are, and your fire will return to you fully. Anyway, you seem fine at the moment. Because I'm near her, I confessed. He paused and raised his brow when I fell silent. I hung my head, resting it in my hands. It's been chaos in my mind and in my soul for so long, I whispered, glaring at the floorboards. But if she's near me, the storm calms and I can think straight. I don't feel as if I'm being torn in twenty different directions. She silences the voices. Voices. The same ones you heard in your cell. I raise my head, wincing. They never stop. Quieted down for a little while, but they're still there. It's not odd for the punishment to carry over, he said slowly. Many demons experience the same when they're released. Those cells do more than torture you. They scar your soul, but I've never heard of another's presence acting as a bomb. Though to be fair, it makes sense if my theory is correct. His face took on the same curious look he'd worn when I nearly ripped his throat out for being near Ashmio. What are you thinking? I ask. That there was a reason Lucifer chose you, even if he didn't know it at the time. The seriousness of his tone had me sitting up straight. A question was on my tongue when a burst of confusion and fear that weren't mine slammed into me. Kneeling by the lounge, I waited for Ashmiel's eyes to open. They fluttered and she cringed, curling in on herself. Easy, I said quietly. Take it slow. Samazrael, she murmured, her eyes opening all the way. She blinked at my face, then her eyes widened and she shot upright. Hank. And those men. We were at the bar. Where, where am I? She glanced wildly around, scrambling further back on the lounge when she spotted Hef. Who's that? Hef, at your service, he said, bowing low. Blacksmith of hell and half-brother to Lucifer. Ashmiel's lips twitched. Right, because the king of hell has family. Yes, he does, and that includes you, Hef added. I growled, and he waved me off. You already told her the truth. No reason not to be blunt about her current predicament. Ah, also, you're currently in hell. Seriously? I said. At the same time, Ashmiel yelled, what? Nothing to worry about, Hef assured her, but his words didn't ease the panic etched on her face or the explosion of heat that pulsed from her and made me wince. How can you not feel that? I asked Hef. The damn demon smiled. Whatever he wasn't telling me, would possibly explain what was happening. The temptation to strangle the truth from him crossed my mind. Too bad he had a few thousand years on me. I'd be lucky if I gave him a bloody nose. I'm in hell, Ashmiel said, then turned to me. You brought me here. Why? If she recalled what she did at the bar, she was doing an excellent job of staying in control. I doubted that was the case. Taking a deep breath to buy me some time, I let it out through my nose and reached for her hand. She pulled away at first but finally let me take it. What do you remember? I ax. Her wide-eyed gaze flicked from me to Hef and back again. She licked her lips, her hand shaking in my grip. I don't. I don't know. That's fine. No need to rush through it. She blew out a breath and shut her eyes. I, ah, uh, I was closing up the bar with Hank and Zane. Then I was alone in the kitchen, and I was arguing with myself. I frowned. Do you do that often? I mean, doesn't everyone? She countered, her eyes flying open, but there was no anger there. Her face paled, and her skin grew cold. But I guess not everyone has a reflection that talks back to them, or has fire in its eyes. When you talk to yourself, have said after I shot him a look asking for guidance here, what does it sound like? This other voice? Sounds like me, she replied. Mostly. She's a bit blunter than I am. Seems pretty pissed off at Lucifer, if he is dear old dad, she added with a quiet laugh. Does it matter right now? No, I said, shooting an annoyed glance at Hef. Do you remember what happened next? She squeezed my hand, her claws pricking my flesh, but I ignored the sting. These guys showed up. And they had Hank. 
Her face scrunched in concentration. Xavier. That was one of their names. I wondered if he was one of the charred corpses. Anything else? She started to shake her head, until her hand clutched mine hard enough to make me flinch. Fire. There was fire everywhere, she whispered. It was like when I attacked you but worse, so much worse. The hand that had been cold seconds before was now burning hot. I did something, didn't I? There was a fight and something happened, that's why I'm here. What did I do? You're here because those men were demon hunters, I said. That doesn't make sense. How did they know before I did? Before any of you showed up at the bar? Her aura pulsed rapidly, and that same unbridled fury I experienced at the bar right before she went supernova appeared in her eyes, dancing with wildfire in her silver eyes. It's all real, isn't it? Everything you told me. Shit, this can't be happening. It can't. You need to calm down, I told her. She yanked her hand free and stormed away. Calm down? How am I supposed to calm down? I'm the devil's own daughter, and those assholes tracked me down. They tried to kidnap me and almost killed Hank. Keeping my face blank was a struggle, but I wasn't about to give away the truth about Hank's death, not while she was close to having a meltdown. I understand this is difficult, but you aren't a normal demon. That fire inside you needs to be controlled. You don't get it, she shouted, throwing her arms up. It's just like before. Before. I ask. What do you mean? Her haunted gaze pierced straight to my heart. She rubbed hard at her right forearm, where some of the worst scars had been located. She was no longer seeing Hef or me. Whatever it was made the fire grow in her eyes. She whispered no, over and over again, wrapping her arms tightly around her body. Her head fell to her chest, and her aura became a shimmering red haze around her, just as it had in the bar. The air grew thick, and I pushed through it, trying to reach her in time. Hef shouted my name in warning. Ignoring him, I went for Ashmiel, my wings sprouting from my back to close around her. I just crushed her to me, my leathery wings encompassing her when she screamed, and her aura sparked into a thousand fiery explosions. I kept most of them contained within my wings, but not all. Gasping when she dug her claws into my chest, I struggled to keep hold of her. This time she hadn't passed out. What's happening to me? She said, her voice more of a growl than words. So, Mazrael. Your demon half isn't being suppressed anymore. Great. So now I'm just a freak? She went rigid in my arms, and another scream tore right through me. This time, the pulsing blast from her aura nearly ripped through my wings, knocking me off my feet, and we slammed into the wall behind me. Her aura settled, though her skin was still burning to the touch. It's going to kill me. Thankfully, I didn't believe that was possible, but there wasn't a chance for me to tell her that. The door to Hef's living quarters slammed open and Blackheart strode inside, swords at the ready. I shoved Ashmiel behind me and spread my wings blocking her from view. What's the meaning of this? Hef demanded. Lucifer wants to see the woman Samazrael brought to hell without his permission. Bones, the commander of the Blackheart, snapped. See who? Hef replied. Bones aimed his blade at Hef. You might be our king's brother, but you're not him. Lucifer felt her presence. Where is she? My claws extended, and the fangs in my mouth elongated. I was more than ready for a fight to keep Ashmiel away from them. The damn woman spoke up behind me. Here. I'm right here. Don't hurt them, all right. What are you doing? I snagged her arm as she moved past. I'm going to have to meet him eventually, right? She replied, shaking in my grasp. Might as well get it over with. You don't have to do this, I whispered. Making a portal and whisking her out of hell sounded like a great idea. Hef had already admitted he wasn't sure how Lucifer would react to finding out Ashmiel was alive. I couldn't risk her life. I'm not going to let these jackasses hurt you, she argued. Something tells me I owe you. I flinched like she'd struck me. For what? I failed you, remember? And you helped save my ass twice now, she retorted. 
Please, Samazrael, I don't want to watch you get hurt. Not because of me. Her fear was quickly replaced with guilt and resolve that had me studying her closely. She was up to something. What was it? Besides, if he kills me, I'm no longer your problem, right? I growled when she pried my fingers off her arm and walked to Bones. He ordered two demons to hold her, and I lunged forward, snarling viciously for them to let her go. Hef grabbed me, but it was Bones' sword tip aimed at my throat that halted me. You might be free of your cell, Bones uttered, and I caught Ashmiel's confused glance, but you're still a piece of shit. A disgrace. You'll never regain your honor, you hear me. You'll always be a failure. He spat at my feet and lowered his blade. Was that necessary, you asshat? Ashmiel snapped. Bone's nostrils flared. He whirled around and backhanded her hard enough to draw blood, and I strained to get free of Hef's grasp. You'll hold your tongue, whatever you are. Ashmiel sniffed hard, her cheek inflamed. She flipped off Bones with both hands. He raised his hand to strike her again, lowered it just as quickly, and ordered the Black Hearts to go. One demon ushered me along behind Ashmiel, leaving Hef the last one out, walking beside Bones. I thought bringing Ashmiel to hell was the best move to keep her safe from the demon hunters. Now, I might have just delivered her straight into the arms of death via the king of hell. How worse could this night get? Chapter 10 Ashmiel I flinched at the grip of the demons dragging me into an intimidating black stone castle. Silver twisted brackets held torches lighting the way, while more intricately designed chandeliers hung from the ceiling. The walls were adorned with tapestries showing a demon with four wings, two obsidian horns, and a brutish face ruling over hell. Lucifer. I gulped, quickly turning my gaze back to the front. Samazrael and Hef had been dragged here too, but they were actually escorted. The demons who'd grabbed us wore all black and had their wings at the ready. Their faces were morphed, much as Samazrael's had been during the fight. Did they really expect me to try and escape, all of them? It wasn't like I wanted to come to hell in the first place. Not as if meeting Lucifer was part of my plans. I wanted to get as far away from Turquoise Falls. And now we're going to meet our father, my inner voice whispered eagerly. You don't have to sound so excited. This is probably going to suck. Is it? We finally get to confront the man who's to blame for the horrors of our life. For what we suffered through. For the death of our mother. The red-hot flash that struck me made the heat of hell feel like a fridge. The voice had a point. It was damn time I met the man who was supposed to be my dad. This was going to be a great family reunion. I tugged on my arms and the demon's grips tightened. I gritted my teeth, fighting against the urge to fight harder. Instinct told me this wasn't going to end well. I wasn't merely walking to meet the king of hell. I was most likely walking to my death. Lucifer might not be thrilled to know his daughter was alive. Shit, he might not even believe I was her in the first place. He won't kill us. We won't give him a chance. Another scorching flash left me stumbling over my feet. The demons quickly righted me and dragged me along. The floor that had been black stone shifted to a grayish red the further we walked. A set of black metal doors were at the end of the hall, flanked by six demons, three on each side. Their black uniforms matched those of the demons escorting us through the castle. Each had two swords at their hips, and a glint in their black eyes that said they were more than ready to kill instead of asking questions of whoever approached those doors. Our party halted at the doors, and one of the demons on the left stepped forward. Bones, Lucifer is expecting you, the demon said, his voice gravelly. The demon who'd struck me earlier stepped forward, leering at me. We've brought the intruder. Intruder? I snapped. I'm not an intruder. I didn't ask to be brought here. Bones snarled at me, and I held the demon's glare and lifted my chin, showing him I wasn't scared. That was mostly true. The tightly coiled anger blocked out most of my fear at what awaited me behind those doors. Allow us entry, Bones ordered. The demons opened the doors, and I shot a look over my shoulder. Samizrael's face was set in a furious scowl, his eyes black voids. When he met my gaze, 
they shifted until I spotted a hint of that vibrant sea green. Then I was hauled forward again and forced to turn around. We passed through the doorway into a room that left my mouth gaping. Unlike the tapestries that had been in the hall, the ones in this room were gorgeous. They were gothic, but the designs were as beautiful as they were dark. Torches hung on the walls in between them. Gray stone columns that seemed to shift in the firelight like smoke lined the right and left sides of the room. Braziers sat before each one, crackling fires inside them flooding the room with even more light. Overhead a massive four-tiered black and red twisted iron chandelier, filled with dripping black candles hung from the center of the ceiling. Demons were gathered in here, too. These were not all guards. Some wore pants and silk shirts, others black suits. A few demons clustered together in black and red robes that dragged the ground when they shifted forward to get a better glimpse of me. Their faces all bore tattoos or other markings. Most had piercings in their ears and noses, too. And all of them stared at me with wide eyes. A few glared, their eyes shifting to black when I passed by them. Why were they pissed? They weren't the ones that had been dragged from their life and brought to hell. The demons holding me shoved me forward, and I fell to my knees, hitting the stone floor. I gasped at the shooting pain in my knees, throwing them both a glare. Neither saw it. They'd sank to one knee on either side of me, bowing their heads low. Sire, we've brought you the intruder, Bone said, his head bowed. Sire. Bracing myself for the monster I was about to come face to face with, I turned my head and froze. I'd been so distracted by everything else in the room, I hadn't even noticed the demon seated on the throne. Lucifer, King of Hell. The raised platform put him above everyone else, not that he needed the added height to remind them he was powerful. The moment I'd lifted my head, a weight slammed into my chest and with it came a sense of confusion interwoven with blind fury. Those weren't my emotions. At least, I didn't think they were. A pair of silver shimmering eyes, much like mine, narrowed while they studied me. The monster I expected to see wasn't seated on that throne. At this point, I wasn't sure which one I'd rather have met. Lucifer's non-beast form was almost more frightening than what I'd seen pictured on those tapestries. He sat leaning to the right on his throne made of bones. Perched at the top of the massive chair was a set of horns that cast a shadow on the floor at his feet. He wore a dark green button-down silk shirt with the sleeves rolled up. Tattoos covered his forearms and the backs of his hands which were resting on the arms of his throne. His claws were partially extended. When he opened his mouth, letting out a quiet growl that echoed around the room, I caught sight of his pointed fangs. Short jet black hair surrounded his obsidian horns. The longer we held each other's eyes, the more I realized what I sensed was coming from Lucifer. How could I feel his emotions? Flames appeared in the silvery depths of his eyes, and he tapped his fingers as if bored. What I thought might have been dread when I first locked eyes with him became clearer. It wasn't fear that stilled me. It was surprise at how familiar his presence was. I'd been around him before, a long time ago. Somewhere in the back of my memories, a flicker of his face appeared, looking down at me and smiling. A smile filled with joy and love. Neither of those emotions was present now. If I could sense him in that way, how was it he hadn't recognized me as his daughter yet? The tapping of his fingers became deafening while my annoyance grew into anger. I was made to think my father hadn't given two shits about my mother or me for my entire life. That he'd up and left us to fend for ourselves. Mom died because he hadn't been around to protect her or me. He obviously hadn't cared enough to keep looking for me. And now he had the nerve to drag me here like I was a criminal? Like I was just another one of his demon flunkies. This was his fault. Mom, the demon hunters, my life on the streets, every bad thing that occurred in my life was all on his head. The fire stirred within me, and a growl slipped past my lips. Lucifer's hand stilled, his eyes narrowing more. Who are you? Don't you know? I snapped. Several demons gasped. He straightened on his throne, fire crackling at his fingertips. You are not here to ask me questions. You are here to answer them. I smirked, the fire inside me growing, clawing higher and higher, wanting to get out. You should be the one to answer to me. 
After all, I am your daughter, I uttered, and the room fell deadly silent. Another weight crashed into me, knocking the air from my lungs, but I recovered quickly. The strikes kept coming, one after another. I braced myself on my knees, not about to be shoved over by Lucifer's rage and disbelief. He pushed to his feet, stalking down the short set of stairs leading from his throne. How dare you? He whispered with a hiss. I cringed when another shockwave of unbridled emotions flowed outward from him. The demons around me cringed and backed away, some bowing low as if trying to avoid his attention from being turned to them. How dare I what? I replied through gritted teeth. Tell you the truth. I didn't want to believe it either, but here we are because two of your demons found me. My name is Ashmiel, I went on when Lucifer paused, his fists clenched at his sides. My mom's name was Dahlia. What more do you want to know, huh? What? Do you want to know how horrible my life was most of the time? How awful it was to see my mom so depressed and sad, and unable to cope when she thought I wasn't looking? How I grew up terrified every damn day of my life? I ranted, unsure when I started yelling. My daughter is dead, Lucifer said, the edge to his words forcing me to take a step back. She was taken from me, as was her mother. You are an imposter. Surprise, I yelled and spread my arms wide. I'm not dead. Maybe you're just pissed you gave up looking for us. The fire in his eyes grew. More flames twisted around his hands and his feet. He growled and in a blink he stood before me. His hand wrapped around my throat, lifting me from the floor. I gasped, clawing at his arm, but he only squeezed harder. Black spots filled my vision, and my body weakened. Somewhere behind me, Samazrael yelled. Hef joined him. Lucifer didn't turn away from me, shouting that his daughter was dead. He ordered the guards to seize Samazrael. Growling and snarling reached my ears, muffled by the lack of oxygen. The spots in my vision grew larger, until they nearly blocked out Lucifer's face. So much for a reunion with dear old dad, I thought grimly. We're just going to let him kill us? Really? What else are we going to do? He's Lucifer, I pointed out. And? The second voice laughed wickedly. Are we his daughter, or aren't we? You're a part of him, and he's a part of you. That doesn't make us weak. It makes us stronger. Show him, prove to him who you are, the voice urged. Who are you? A tiny part of me wondered if I should worry about having this voice inside my head. But it was right, it usually was. After everything I'd been through, and all Samazrael had told me, after feeling the power I had buried inside me, was I simply going to give up? Samazrael shouted my name, telling me to fight even while Lucifer bellowed for the guards to silence him. I might be pissed with Samazrael for failing to protect my mother and me, but no one was going to kill him. Not on my watch. He owed me answers. And he saved my life twice since meeting him. He could have let me be, and pretend he never found me. Only he hadn't. Who are you? Tell me damn it. Struggling to stay conscious I murmured back, Ashmiel, daughter of Lucifer, the king of hell. My eyes slipped closed, but I wasn't about to drift away. I let the last of my control break, and the roiling chaos in my gut swarmed my limbs with a vengeance. I didn't just feel the storm. I became it, embodied it, and let it loose. A shriek ripped from my throat, my eyes flew open and a shockwave of fire exploded outward from my center. It tore through the room, throwing everyone out of its path, including Lucifer. He was slammed into a stone column, his head striking it with a loud crack. Everyone else ended up on their asses and crashing into the walls, until Lucifer and I were the only ones left standing. The hollowness I'd experienced every day growing up became filled with this raging storm. The voice inside my head sighed in relief and melded into me. There was a sharp pain, then a searing heat as if the wound that had split me in two had finally healed. The part of myself I hadn't been able to find was in its rightful place, seated in my core. It had been there along but tucked away, blocked from my sight. Years of uncertainty and hesitation burned away in the face of my newly released energy coursing through my veins. I stretched my hands to my sides, relishing in the energy filling me up. 
Lucifer pushed away from the column. I snarled, whipping my head in his direction. I didn't even wince at the slight pain from fangs extending from my gums or claws growing at my fingertips. He paused, his face unreadable. Two demon guards scrambled to their feet and charged me. Orange and red flames circled around my hands and surrounded my feet. When the demons were close enough, I raised my hands. Whips of fire lashed at them, slicing down their faces and chests. They were thrown back, only to be replaced by three more. My body reacted all on its own, and I let the power guide my actions. The remainder of the guards in the room rushed me. I wasn't able to beat them all back. They snagged my arms and shoulders, holding me fast in their grip. I cursed, yanking on my limbs to get free. Out of the corner of my eye, I spotted some Azrael lunging forward until three demons seized him, holding him back. He dragged them across the floor as more piled on, preventing him from moving. A strange pressure built in my back, and I rolled my shoulders to ease it. With more demons holding me down, I curled in on myself, and when I straightened, screaming at the agony exploding from my shoulder blades, the demons were thrown from me. Lucifer's eyes widened, darting to what was now behind me. My shadow on the floor was no longer simply my silhouette. Now it was outlined with wings. Wings. By damn. I had wings. They lowered, draping on the floor like a cape. I wanted to admire them, but there wasn't a chance to stop. More guards moved in around me, and my wings wrapped around me forming a shield. Enough, Lucifer demanded, holding up his hand. The guard stilled, waiting for his next command. Lucifer slowly approached, his face remaining hidden behind that unreadable mask. His emotions however were still there, fierce as ever. When he reached me, my wings parted. His face shifted to a look of awe and disbelief. Daughter, he whispered, reaching out a hand to cup my cheek. I flinched away, unsure if I should trust the demon who tried to strangle me. He frowned but moved to touch me a second time. I held still. The second his fingertips brushed my cheek, I was thrown into a memory I'd only ever glimpsed in my dreams, a man staring down at me while I was cradled in his arms. A smile had broken across his usually severe face and tears shimmered in his eyes. He'd said the same word to me then as he had now, and the storm inside me calmed. I leaned into Lucifer's hand and he tensed. Out, he uttered roughly. Everyone out. Now. There was a rush of steps and an opening of doors. Some Azrael hef, you stay. Once the four of us were alone, Lucifer lowered his hand. Ashmiel. I never thought I'd say your name again. I shrugged at Lucifer's words. I never thought I'd meet my father or that he'd be you, I replied quietly. All this time, you had no idea who you were? None until Samazrael found me, I explained. Not that I believed him. How could I? Yes, how could you after he failed you, Lucifer said with a growl, glaring at Samazrael. How long have you kept my daughter from me? He moved faster than I could keep up with and had his claws at Samazrael's throat, ready to rip it out. How long? Don't, I yelled, rushing forward to break them apart. Lucifer seemed as confused as I was when I managed to shove him back. He saved my life. Twice. I won't let you hurt him. He's also the reason you were taken from me. Lucifer's eyes were solid black while he glared at Samazrael over my shoulder. I never should have released you from your cell, since all you can do is betray me. I only knew for a few days, Samazrael replied. I swear it on my life. And why should I believe you? Lucifer shouted. After everything you put me through, give me one reason I shouldn't toss you back in that cell for eternity. Demon hunters are trying to kill her, Samazrael told him. Lucifer glanced at me. How do they know of her? I don't know, Samazrael said but I doubt they'll stop trying to harm her. Lucifer bared his fangs but stalked away from Samazrael, moving around the room, leaving burning steps in his wake. Belatedly, I noticed he was barefoot. I don't understand, he finally muttered, whirling around to pin me with a confused and angry glower. Where have you been? How are you alive? Did you and your mother escape? 
Where's Dahlia? At her name, the darkness receded, and silver eyes looked back at me filled with love so strong it broke my heart. She's dead, I replied. Lucifer's face went dangerously blank. How? My wings rustled and my claws extended. Because of you. I did not kill Dahlia. You sure about that? I snapped. Everything is your fault. All of it. Lucifer came toward me, his presence warring against mine. You were stolen from me. You both were. How is that my fault? I don't know what happened that night, and frankly I don't give a shit. I stood toe-to-toe -to -toe with him, leaning back so I could keep my gaze locked on his. All I remember is growing up with a mom who would stare out the windows, depressed and sad. The only time she talked about you, she told me you were the reason we had to run. You were the reason we couldn't stay in one place for more than a few months. What did you do to her, huh? I demanded. What did you do to make her so afraid? I smashed my palms into his chest with my words. This time he didn't move. I did nothing to her or to you, he whispered sharply. I don't believe you, you bastard. I don't. I beat his chest until he caught my hands and held them. I screamed at him to let me go, thrashing around like a wild beast. I wasn't even sure what I was yelling anymore, but the words kept coming. During my struggles, the sleeves of my shirt slid down. Lucifer's hands around my wrists grew incredibly hotter, and his gaze flicked downward. I cursed, trying to yank my arms back, but his grip was far stronger than Samizrael's had been. Don't, I begged when he started to push the sleeve up. He ignored me, and I turned away, not wanting to see the scars that marred my skin. Lucifer's presence pulsed around me, his fury colliding with mine. Sparks crackled in the air around us. His fingers found my chin and turned me to face him. Who did this to you? He whispered, his voice shaking. Who? Why do you care? He bared his fangs, and I did it right back to him. You will tell me where you've been all these years. Every detail of your life. I tore my arms free and staggered away. No. You don't get to say no to me. Why? Because you're my father? Where were you, huh? Where were you when demon hunters came for us and killed mom? I ranted, tears burning in my eyes. Why did she run from you? Why? His jaw clenched and flames burned around his feet, creeping up his legs. I don't know. Maybe you should figure it out. I don't owe you a damn thing, but you? You owe me a life. My life. I shook my head, waiting for him to give me something, anything to help me understand. All he did was stand there, silent and scowling. I rolled my shoulders, wanting my wings to go away. They retreated into my back. I turned around, and pausing only long enough to look at some Azrael, I bolted for the doors. Chapter 11 Some Azrael. The door slammed shut behind Ashmiel. I started to go after her when Lucifer said my name. Bones will ensure she stays close, he told me. I didn't turn away from the door, my need to go after Ashmiel practically dragging me forward. It would appear you and I need to have a talk, Lucifer went on. Your oath to protect my daughter still stands. What? Ashmiel is alive, Lucifer stated once I turned around. The flames that had sprouted at his feet went out with a puff of black smoke, and he marched to his throne. Are you telling me you're not up to the task? I glanced to have for help but the blacksmith shrugged saying, he's right. He's right. That's all you're going to say. I couldn't believe this. Part of me was still in awe from watching Ashmiel fully embrace her demon half. Her leathery wings appeared as delicate as black smoke when they burst from her back, shimmering and rippling with her emotions. The short sharp bones pikes that jutted from the joint were beautiful in their deadliness. I'd never seen wings such as hers. Not even Lucifer's were so unique. Sitting on his throne, Lucifer studied me. I fail to see what the issue is here. I failed you, I said, as if he needed reminding. You threw me in a cell in the ninth level of hell. True. And I released you ten years ago. Tell me, 
Why did you see fit to continue your punishment when the king of hell believed you'd suffered enough? My mouth fell open but no words came out. The voices inside my head were whispering viciously, but I couldn't make out what they were saying. Ashmiel's aura lingered in the room and on my skin, letting me stay in control. That control wouldn't last forever. I let your only child be stolen. How could that sin ever be forgiven? Lucifer breathed out heavily. His shoulders sagged, and for the first time in my life, the king of hell appeared exhausted and broken. There are many things you never had a chance to understand. That is my fault, and now is not the time nor the place to get into them. What aren't you telling me? I demanded, rushing forward. You and Hef are keeping secrets. Why? Because some things you need to learn on your own, Lucifer said. That's all I'm going to say on the matter, so don't bother asking again. I was going to do just that, but instead, I shut my mouth. Besides, if what Ashmiel says is true, then you weren't the one who betrayed me, Lucifer went on quietly. One way or another, I will find out what happened to Dahlia and Ashmiel. My daughter needs to tell me everything, and you're going to be the one to get those answers for me. Convince her she needs to tell me all she remembers. Who says she'll tell me anything? Lucifer's lip twitched, and he leaned back in his throne. Everything. I licked my lips, not liking the glimmer of hatred emanating from Lucifer. You won't hurt her, I warned. I won't let you. Who says I'm going to hurt her? She's my daughter. And right now, you think she betrayed you? His eyes narrowed. I fought the urge to take a step back from the intensity of this gaze. If Dahlia had a part in their disappearance, Ashmiel had no part in it. We shall see. Until then, I charge you with your original oath. Protect my daughter at all costs. I sank to one knee and bowed my head. With respect, I can't. I fail to see why. My years in the cell have left me broken, I confessed. I'm not as strong as I once was, and I carry too many scars to be able to carry out my duty effectively. I almost admitted that a part of me blamed Ashmiel and wanted to see her harmed. No matter how hard I tried, those words wouldn't come. And whose fault is that? Lucifer acts. I released you ten years ago. You should have taken the chance to go, but you chose to continue to punish yourself. He rose from his throne. Fire burst around him and spilled from his eyes. Find a way. You are her protector. There is no changing that, not unless you die. I bowed once more, then stood. Yes, my king, I said, and my gut nodded with apprehension. Now go. My daughter has much to learn, and you will be the one to teach her. I had just reached the door when he called me back. Yes, sire. If you fail me again, if she is taken by these demon hunters or killed, your years in that cell will seem like a paradise to what I have in store for you. Do not fail me again, Samazrael. His threat pierced my soul. Numbly. I turned and hurried out of the hall. Demons filled the space, most of them giving me varying looks of disgust and confusion while I hurried past. With Lucifer's final words echoing in my ears, I picked up the pace to find Ashmiel. Her aura left an easy enough trail for me to follow, and I tracked her to the courtyard. Bones watched over her. When he saw me coming, he marched away. Ashmiel was sitting on the rocky ground, her back to the wall. Her eyes were shut, and her cheeks were wet like she'd been crying. I was a few feet away when she whispered, I want to go home. How did she know it was me? I hadn't even said anything. This is your home, I replied. Her eyes slid open. I wasn't surprised to see a fire burning in them. No, it's not. You're the daughter of Lucifer. This is his domain and yours. But my mother was a fallen angel, right? Doesn't that mean I can live somewhere in between? Not when there are demon hunters after you. Down here is safer. She smiled bitterly. Not because I'm unstable, and probably going to kill a bunch of people on accident. I glanced away, and she was on her feet in a shot. Tell me, she demanded. 
tell you what. I did something in the bar, and it was bad. I can see it on your face. What did I do? I'll tell you after you tell me about your life, I countered. You started to say something when we were with Hef. What was it? Her lips thinned. A flush came over her cheeks, and she stormed away from me. Where are you going? Home. I know there's a way to leave here. I just have to figure out how. I wasn't about to show her how to make a portal. Crossing my arms, I watched her shake out her hands, muttering under her breath. Fire sparked at her fingertips. She smirked. Now would be as good a time as any to start her lessons on control, if she was going to mess with Hellfire. I was about to start with the basics, hoping, if nothing else, it'd distract her and me from how her first meeting with Lucifer had gone, when two small balls of fire shot from her hand. They twirled around each other, and a portal opened in front of her. My arms fell to my sides. She let out a triumphant yell and rushed through it. I cursed, running after her. We stepped out in a small parking lot. A quick look around told me exactly where we'd landed. I snagged Ashmiel's hand and pulled her back to the portal that was still open. We're leaving. No, we're not, she snapped, twisting out of my grasp. I want to see Hank. Ashmiel, don't, I yelled. She took off for the back door to the bar. When I caught up to her inside, she stood in the center of the bar. The windows and door had been cordoned off with police tape. There were no bodies on the floor. Not anymore. Ashmiel stepped over the burned debris, her eyes wide. I did this, she whispered, turning a horrified gaze to me. You didn't know what that you were doing. She blinked rapidly, her chest rising and falling while her breaths came in loud panicky pants. There were people in here when I lost it. A lot of them. The demon hunters and, and Hank. She clapped a hand to her mouth, shaking her head. I went to her and tried to pull her into my arms, but she screamed and pushed me away. What did I do? She shouted. Hank. Where is he? Where's Zane? We can talk about this in hell. Please take my hand, holding it out to her. She backed away, tripping over a table and chair that crumbled at her touch. The fire. It was everywhere, and I couldn't control it. Where's Hank? She asked again. I hesitated, and she lost it. Her aura crackled around her while she howled like a wounded animal, clawing at the floor. She screamed for Hank over and over while I hauled her off the floor. She fought me, and I took her blows and her pain dragging her through the wreckage of the bar. Her skin burned, and fire erupted at her feet. Control it, I growled. There was no response except another scream that blasted me into the wall. Grunting, I pushed off it, and hoping she'd forgive me later, punched her. Her head flew back, and she collapsed in my arms. Kill her, the voices screamed, startling me. Do it, do it now. I'm her protector and I will keep her safe, I snarled in reply. You'll fail again, the voices warned while I carried Ashmiel through the back of the bar and toward the portal that had remained open. You'll fail and then you'll learn what real pain is. Lucifer will destroy you. He'll tear your soul apart piece by piece. Ashmiel will be your downfall. I paused staring into her face. Lucifer's and Hef's words returned to me. Frowning, I gently lifted Ashmiel in my arms and pressed my lips to her forehead. No, she's going to be the reason I live, I whispered, and the voices fell silent. Bracing myself for how long the next few days were going to be, I walked through the portal, returning to hell with Lucifer's daughter, the way it always should have been. Thank you for listening. This has been a Ciara Graves book. Don't forget to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified of new releases.